Let's go. Do it. All right. Good evening, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 14th, 2013 at 6.30 p.m., and this is the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. My name is Judson Pierce, and I'm proud to chair this hard-working committee. Um, in just a few moments, we will see an example of our very own Arlington High School students taking a bit of risk. Uh, the Arlington High School Drama Guild will be presenting Tim Robbins' Dead Man Walking tonight. They open in an hour, folks. Uh, they're, they're opening tonight, and they're running through Saturday, this weekend at 7.30 in the Lowe Auditorium. According to our guest uh, tonight, the drama coach Michael Byrne, Dead Man Walking is based on the nonfiction book of the same title, written by Sister Helen Krijan, based on her experience as a spiritual counselor and a, and a fictional death row inmate, Matthew Poncelet. The play is a work of fiction by real life, inspired by real life experiences. Our students are partnering with the Prison Books Program and they're sponsoring a book drive. And representatives of this program will be at the performances to collect books. Um, I know from personal experience that getting on stage involves some measure of risk taking and certainly a play with this challenging subject matter even more so. So with that said, I'd like to invite uh, you folks uh, into this little stage, if you will. Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Byrne, as Mr. Pierce said. Um, the uh, Dead Man Walking School Theater Project allows only colleges and high schools to perform this play. And there are stipulations that we have to meet. Um, we have to involve at least two other academic departments, sponsor creative art and music projects, and provide feedback to the Dead Men's uh, Walking School Theater Project. Arlington High School is the first public school in Massachusetts to present Dead Men Walking. Some of the collaborations that we've done so far um, are that Dead Men Walking was the choice of the Arlington Intergenerational Book Club for the fall. Um, the uh, AHS Drama Guild partnered with the Prison Books Program and is sponsoring the book drive and offering discounted uh, tickets to anyone who is interested in donating a book. Um, sophomore Cora Flanagan interviewed members of the cast and then interviewed Father George Williams, chaplain at San Quentin State Prison. And the final product of that video is on display in the lobby where she spliced the interview together so that the students at Arlington asked questions and they were answered by Father Williams. Um, the classes that included Dead Men Walking as part of their study are Advanced Placement Literature, Race, Identity, and Society, Introduction to American Law, Advanced Placement, Language, and Composition, Missing Voices in Other Cultures, Mixed Media and Sculpture, and the music tech students designed the sound used in tonight's show, and one of the students um, composed and performed a song that will be used in tonight's show. So I'm going to hand it over to the actors now. My youth is the faith of my future. But never in my youth could I have imagined where my faith would take me. As a young nun, it was simple. What counted was a personal relationship with God, inner peace, kindness to others, and heaven when life is done. In 1980, my religious community, the Sisters of St. Joseph, made a commitment to stand on the side of the poor. And I had gone along, but reluctantly. I didn't want to struggle with politics or economics. We were nuns after all, not social workers. Even Jesus Christ himself had said, the poor you will always have with you. That all changed in June 1980. Some glaring injustices were pointed out to me by a sociologist, Sister Marie Augusta Neal. The poor aren't there magically. The poor are poor as a result of specific business decisions, specific oppression, specific greed. To be apolitical in the face of these injustices is to uphold the status quo a very political position to take. To not actively fight against injustice is to actively condone it. Jesus preached good news to the poor, that they are to be poor no longer, which meant that the poor were not meant to accept their poverty and suffering as God's will, but instead struggled to obtain the necessities of life which were rightfully theirs. Sister Neil viewed Jesus as a social visionary, an activist, what we might call a radical today. And we, we sisters of the Catholic Church, had an obligation to carry on that activism, that advocacy for the poor. 
Something inside me must have been building towards this moment because there was a flash, a revelation, an epiphany, if you will, and I walked out of my meeting with Sister Neil forever changed, never to look back. One year later, I was living in the St. Thomas Housing Development in New Orleans, Louisiana. I worked at a place called Hope House, which did lots of things, from distributing food to running daycare centers to tutoring. We shared the space with a group that worked with prisoners. I tutored high school students. How can X times Y equals Z? They're letters. Who hmm? told me you can multiply letters? They're concepts. They represent numbers. Well, why are they hiding? Y and X represent sides of the triangle. They're not hiding. It's a formula to find out the distance of Z. Mm hmm Sister Prejean, got a second? Yeah. Listen, sister, we've got this fella. Death row in me? He could use a pen pal, doesn't have anyone. I was wondering if you could write to him. Sure. His name is Matthew Ponsolet. He's in for murder. Maybe I ought to give you someone else. This guy's a loner and doesn't write. Maybe you want someone who will answer your letters. Nah, don't change it. Give him to me. He's from Slidell, Louisiana. We've got files at the office if you want to read about the case. I didn't know much about the death penalty at this point, but I did know enough to assume that anyone occupying a cell in Louisiana's death row did not come from money. So I saw getting involved with this as a logical extension of my work with the poor. Like my new digs? I'm pretty special, huh? Got this place all to myself. Got eight guys guarding me. One dude checks me every 15 minutes to see if I've killed myself. Suicide watch. Never had so many people care about how I was doing. When did you come out here? Last night. Late. Didn't get a chance to say goodbye to the guys in the row. Most of them were sleeping. Did you get me that lie detector test? I made some calls. No luck yet. So this is the end. The death house vacation. Three days of quiet. Plenty of time to read my Bible, eh, sister? <laughs> Look for a loophole. Did you read anything in that Bible about Jesus? Holy man did good in heaven and praised Jesus. There's passages in there about the suffering of Jesus when he was alone and facing death that you might find interesting. Me and Jesus had a different way of dealing with things. He was one of those turn the other cheek guys. Takes a lot of strength to turn the other cheek, Matt. You say you like rebels. What do you think Jesus was? He wasn't no rebel? Sure he was. He was a dangerous man. What's so dangerous about love your brother? His love changed things, Matt. People that nobody cared about, prostitutes, beggars, the poor, finally had someone that respected them, loved them, made them part of a family, made them realize their own worth. In his eyes, they had dignity and were becoming a social force, threat to the established order, and that made the guys at the top very nervous, and so they went and arrested Jesus. Kind of like me, huh? No, Matt. Not at all like you, not at all. He created a better world. He changed it with his love. You stood by and watched while two kids were killed. Mahatma Gandhi once said, if we were all to give an eye for an eye, the world would be blind. Jesus Christ showed us that the only way to stop this mad circle of violence and retribution was through love and reconciliation. Love for everyone, even those that inflict pain. For the family of a victim, this is an emotion that seems unattainable, impossible. Perhaps there is redemption in reconciliation. Perhaps there is some peace in not letting the hatred overtake you, in not letting those who have hurt you continue to after they're gone. If we reconcile, do our memories of our loved ones fade or do we honor our loved ones with a wish for everlasting peace, a holy place, without violence, hatred, or revenge? Only time will tell. something from Act 2, and then something from her final monologue. Is there, are you offering a talk back after the performances? Um, we aren't, yeah, we aren't. Um, <laughs> we want to, you know, respect people's time and let them go. Yeah. Um, but we um, have been, I have been contacted by the Prison Books Program to have something later, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, and uh, there's someone who works on the Emerald Necklace with um, inmates, and 
we think that this probably will not be the end of our exploration of this. There's another play that Tim Robbins produced called The Exonerated that I've been thinking about looking at, too. Um, so I think the discussion will continue after the play. Could you uh, just explain uh, the, the books program you talked about, what type of books you're looking for? Um, yes, they'll take anything published within the last 30 years. They do not want hardcover books. They are in particular need of dictionaries and um, books in other languages. and I was watching Rachel Maddow one night and um, Sister Helen Prejean was on as a guest because this is the 20th anniversary of the publishing of the original book and uh, there's a new foreword and so she is you know, doing the rounds. And she just mentioned very off the cuff that Tim Robbins had written this play version um, that only high schools and colleges can do. And so I Googled right away and I was convinced it was going to be a three person play um, that would not be appropriate for high schools to do. And it's a 43 person play. Um, and 42 people auditioned, so <laughs> someone gets two roles. Um, but, uh, and then I, I reread the book having you know, read it 20 years ago, and it, it seems really present now. One of the things that, it reminded me of when um, Dukakis was running for president, which I had to tell these kids about, um, and when he was asked what if something happened to Kitty, what would he feel? And one of the things that Sister Helen says is that's an unfair question, an unanswerable question. But, the, the, but an easier, if there is such a thing, question to answer about the death penalty is what if someone hurt you? How would you feel about it? And I had a very different answer to that. Um, and she also, one of Cora's lines is, can you say it exactly, about being judged by your worst? Um, every person is worth more than his worst act. And the idea of forgiveness and redemption, um, and with Jokar Sarnayev, but pop, you know, we think it's very removed from Massachusetts, but something that happened four or five miles from us could very easily involve the death penalty. And so I think it's something that young people should be thinking about. And to do a contemporary play is a difficult thing in high schools um, because contemporary plays have three characters and one set. And that's very economical to do, but it, I think it's unfair educationally. So when I saw a contemporary play with 43 characters um, about a topic that invited you to dig, dig deep and involve other people and um, have really great academic conversations about it, even just with the other teachers that are teaching it over the lunch table. Those, that's what we've been talking about for, for two months. So to me, it just seemed, as soon as I knew that it was a play, it seemed like, I read it once and I said, yes, this is what we're going to do. I just want to congratulate the students that put together the video. I had a chance to watch it last night, and all of your questions were really interesting to hear. And it was a really nice, kind of thoughtful way of getting ready to watch the play. Um, the interview was great, and the footage was great. So, congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank great you. Nice thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please go to see Dead Men Walking at the high school uh, this weekend. It's, it's not to be missed. It, this reminds me a lot of the Laramie Project, Moises yeah. Kaufman, the Tectonic Theater Company, and, and <coughs> coming uh, together with a, with a real tragic moment and, and, and really digging deep, like you said. It's wonderful, and thanks for presenting tonight to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. I don't always come to the school committee for theater, but that was just phenomenal. It was such a pleasure. Um, so what, what, I, what I did come to the school committee tonight, meeting tonight, is to invite you all, the um, school committee, the school community, and the Arlington community to the Arlington Education Foundation's fall celebration. It will be happening next Monday, November 18th, from 6 to 8 at Flora Restaurant, so we'll have some very good food. Um, the speakers for the event will be Dr. Matthew Janger, the new high school principal, and Catherine Ritz, who's the director of World Languages. Um, one of the reasons we come together in our fall celebration every year is not only to celebrate the work that AEF has done with the schools over the past year, but also to celebrate new projects. Um, we're very excited about a new three-year technology initiative we're rolling out, um, a new grant category, Continuing Scholars Grant for teachers. Um, and I would also invite you to, to take a look at today's advocate because there's a wonderful article about the, the technology initiative and the new STEM lab at the high school that was funded via the, partially through the technology initiative. So please join us um, to learn a little bit more about these, these programs and our past programs. Again, our event will be Monday, November 18th from 6 to 8. We hope you all are, will be able to make it, and it's at Flora uh, Restaurant on Mass Ave. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here for public participation tonight? <laughs> um, I'd like to just go over the the Bishop and uh, Hardy Schools art that is adorning our walls. Uh, first with grade one uh, from the Hardy Mixed Media Collage. The first grade students created mixed media collages inspired by Nancy Stanley, a contemporary artist from Texas. Nancy Stanley works in various media and creates beautiful collages of animals and everyday objects and food using maps, newspapers, patent, uh, pattern papers, and painting. The students in the first grade observed and discussed her artwork and how she created her pieces. And they learned about mixed media art and how it refers to artwork that uses more than one art medium or material that artists use to create artwork. The students were asked to choose an everyday object to use in their own personal artwork and create their own mixed media collage using print and paper. Now grade two, which is on that board, they did Picasso faces. And the second grade students created imaginary faces inspired by Cuba style portraits of Pablo Picasso. Picasso was one of the pioneers of Cubism, an art form where an artist observes objects and people from different viewpoints or perspectives and assembles them together in an abstract way. Second graders observed and discussed several of Picasso's Cubist portraits. They used oil pastels on colored paper to create their own imaginary portraits using Picasso as inspiration. The students were asked to pay close attention to what colors they chose and where they placed the facial features. Grade three from Bishop, I think that's Bishop, they did narrative prints. The third grade students created prints based on the narrative nature of the prints of Alison Boyd, a contemporary printmaker form. Um, narrative artwork is artwork that tells a story. And one type of narrative art occurs when the pictures look like snapshots of a story that's in the process of unfolding. The students observed and discussed Boyd's artwork. They discussed what narrative art is and how Boyd's work represents that idea. The students created painting, uh, printing plates for their original image that represented their own idea of narrative art. The printing plates were created by drawing lines into styrofoam plates, and they took rollers and rolled a thin layer of ink over the styrofoam printing plates. 
a clean piece of paper was placed on top of the inked printing plate, and the inked image was transferred onto the paper, making a print or copy of that image. Grade four, which is right behind Mr. Spray, Fiona Hall Birds. The fourth grade students created three-dimensional birds out of various papers. The project was inspired by the Australian art artist Fiona Hall and her exhibition and interactive installation at the Gallery of Modern Art in Australia. Fiona Hall created sculptural birds' nests created out of shredded U.S. currency. This was a <laughs> this was a commentary on how the spending of money on things such as cars, plastics, etc., affects the environment in a negative way. The installation "Fly Away Home" tied into this theme and allowed children to come into the gallery and create their own paper birds, hopefully not out of currency, uh, to add to wooden tree sculptures. The fourth grade students pretended they were in the gallery and invented their own imaginative birds out of paper, tissue paper, tape, glue, and markers. And they were required to problem solve and invent ways to make the birds three-dimensional from these two-dimensional pieces of paper. And last but not least, grade five, students right over there did tertiary paintings, mixed media paintings inspired by the art of contemporary artists, the Dia and the Carp. Macaro's colorful abstract paintings translate her emotions, thoughts, and energy into complex designs and patterns. She's heavily influenced by the art of various cultures around the world as she began traveling around the world when she was six weeks old. Macaro's paintings include primary colors, red, yellow, blue, and secondary colors, orange, green, and purple. They include the six tertiary colors, which the fifth graders focused on. Tertiary colors are made when the adjoining primary and secondary colors are mixed together to make colors such as yellow-orange, red-orange, red-violet, etc. The fifth grade students were asked to create artwork where they used primary colors to make a painting focusing on shapes and lines to create a feeling of energy, using Ricardo's paintings as inspiration. They were required to mix their own secondary and tertiary colors, and once the painting was complete, the students added oil pastel details. Beautiful artwork here. Thank you, Bishop and party students, sir coming together on this. Speaking of the hard work that it takes to do this artwork, I'd, I'd just like to take this moment to uh, give some congratulations to my colleague, Jeff Thielman. Jeff was honored last week with the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Massachusetts School Committee's Association and Mass uh, School Superintendents Association Joint Conference in Hyannis. I was happy to be there, along with uh, some of the colleagues here at the table and our superintendent. Uh, to witness the presentation. Jeff, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, friends, my, my opening remarks tonight deal with two broad and important themes, and some of them come out of the conference that I attended last week. How these themes relate to one another. Leadership and taking risks. We all just saw an example of our students taking risks with the play Dead Man Walking. Regarding leadership, it was 150 years ago November 19th, next week, and one of the greatest speeches in American history was delivered, the Gettysburg Address. On November 19th, 19, uh, 1863, a cemetery known as the Soldiers National Cemetery was dedicated just south of Gettysburg. President Abraham Lincoln wrote 10 sentences, comprised of 272 words, spoke for two minutes, and changed our nation forever. <coughs> He never used I or me. President Lincoln took considerable risk during his presidency, and we're all very thankful that he did so. Which brings me to tonight. Tonight, we exercise one of our most important responsibilities as school committee members. We evaluate our superintendent in open session. And there really is no coincidence that we had to play dead man walk in <laughs> on the evaluation. Okay, there's really nothing to, okay. We, we, we take this responsibility seriously, folks. I will give, I will give you a preview of my report. Okay. Our superintendent leads, she leads gracefully, and with an eye towards the future and the success of our students. She takes appropriate and calculated risks to further our district goals. That's a preview. As author and frequent lecturer Mike Staver stated in his book, Leadership Isn't for Cowards, never ever assume you've tried everything. I guarantee you, you haven't. 
<coughs> also, don't assume that because you tried it once, it will never work. Results require work, not trying. Our students here tonight, as well as our superintendent, exemplify this too. Moving on. Superintendent's evaluation. It's a little bit different this year than in past years because we had a new structure uh, sort of mandated by the DESC. Um, but we had come up with overall district goals as we have in past years using our old format. We evaluate the superintendent on a November to November year timeline, in part because we get the results of our MCAS uh, scores in October. Um, and we like to use and incorporate those scores uh, in our evaluation. So it presents us with an interesting sort of transition uh, superintendent evaluation year in that we're evaluating based on the 2012-2013 school year, which is long ago ended. But again, we've received uh, the scores uh, from MCAS, which is part and parcel to some of our evaluation pieces tonight. And we use our old uh, CBIE policy and CBIE instrument tonight. Now, Mr. Hainer, uh, and some others here uh, have, have tried to incorporate some of the uh, standards, uh, indicators, rubric, if you will, that we will be using a year from now um, as best we can. Uh, so this is an experiment in the transition. Uh, what I would like to do is start out um, by seeing if any of the members have any opening comments they'd like to make. Um, and if so, you know, now's, now's the time to do that. And then what I'd like to do is, following the old CBIE form, where we have two sections, section one, four competencies, and section two, uh, district goals, uh, strategic <coughs> goals now called, uh, go, go in that order in a round robin fashion. So starting with core competency one with Dr. Allison Ampey, going around the table, core competency two, Ms. Heim, and, and, and that. And, and if anyone feels that there's part of their written material that we have in front of us that has been left out and hasn't been touched on, please, um, please, you know, raise your hand during the proceedings or right after. I'd also like to give the members um, some pause here. If you veer off your written comments and speak uh, sort of extemporaneously based on what you've heard tonight, Please mark that for Ms. Fitzgerald so she can mark that in the minutes so she knows that um, there's, there's, there's a difference in your writing and, and what you spoke here tonight. Um, and again, we're not doing this live because of technical problems. It will be aired uh, starting tomorrow, Friday, uh, the 15th, on ACMI. Um, and hopefully we're going to be uh, live next Thursday. Um, and it will be next Thursday, not two Thursdays from now. We had to make a change uh, due to the Thanksgiving holiday coming up. So. Um, Mr. Hammond. I just want to, uh, as the chair, Mr. Pierce has said, uh, I will be passing several times during this because I have decided to use, try to use the newer form and did not go back to the, uh, using the older form as some of my colleagues have. It's not a judgment one way or the other. It's just an understanding. And all these documents are available to the public in the future. So that's, that's, that's really, yeah, Mr. Schlick. I want to thank Mr. Hainer for putting the new form into a template that we could use. I, too, follow the new form, uh, in, in part because I've been working on uh, familiarizing myself, myself with the new rubrics in my day job. Great. Okay. So why don't we uh, go ahead um, with Section 1, uh, Core Competencies, um, having to do with Committee Superintendent Relations. Okay, the superintendent keeps the school committee informed on issues, needs, and the operation of the school system. She offers professional advice to the school committee on items requiring school committee action with appropriate recommendations based on thorough study and analysis. The superintendent maintains a professional working relationship with the school committee and interprets, supports, and executes the intent of all school committee policy and goals and objectives of and provides recommendations as requested. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, in commendation, um, I commend the superintendent on her hard work and her dedication to our schools. I recognize that she has devoted much of her time 
and energy to running the Arlington Public Schools, and I greatly appreciate this. I also commend the superintendent on communicating to the school committee the changing picture that is our state's educational policy and activities, because um, it seems like it changes every other week. On your recommendations, I recommend that the administration ensures that school committee input is sought before making financial decisions about funding, um, about splitting funds with the town. This input was missing before proposals were made regarding kindergarten fee offsets and the splitting of the chapter, the increased chapter 70 funds. Second, that the administration better communicate facilities issues such as snow removal and maintenance to the school committee. This would involve improved collection of ongoing problems, analysis of the source of problems, and presentation of this information. Possible solutions could also be included. We're lacking appropriate facilities needs information that would enable us to make good budgetary decisions. Third, that the superintendent with the chair make creation of a long-term agenda priority, as was discussed during governance. This agenda would allow for school committee members to anticipate upcoming topics. The superintendent needs to make an effort to assign dates to topics and follow through and <coughs> work with the chair to support supplying information to the school committee well in advance of our meetings. And finally, in communications, the superintendent act more as a distiller of information rather than a consolidator. I feel end of year evaluation reports should capture essential information on goal completion in a sentence or two with supporting data following and then all information should be written in a similar style, similar style with the same voice. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hunt? Um, accommodations, and uh, excuse me, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep the voice this whole meeting. Dr. Bode keeps committee members informed of issues regarding the school system in a timely manner. If there is some urgency or public attention to an issue, she calls committee members personally. When the issue is appropriate, it is shared through email, in person, at a regular meeting, or through newsletters and communications. When the committee needs to take action, in addition to Dr. Bode's guidance, she has brought in other experts, such as legal representatives, principals, directors, etc., to provide information to the committee. Additionally, Dr. Bode, oops. Additionally, Dr. Bode has. Um, Continue to strengthen her relationship with the committee through the MASC, MASS, DESC school governance program. Under recommendations, um, my recommendation is that Dr. Bodie should take the next step with the committee by continuing to work on a year-long agenda to ensure that the committee has the necessary information to make decisions around the budget and meet all legal obligations. Thank you, Mr. Slick. I'll pass right now. Accommodations, the, the superintendent has kept the school committee informed of issues facing the school. She attends nearly all subcommittee meetings and she responds quickly to inquiries from the committee. I find the recommendations on policy matters to be helpful, carefully considered, and in the best interest of the district. She understands and supports our needs to respond to a question from the public. I don't have any recommendations on that standard. Um, under commendations, I've seen an improvement in the communication level between the superintendent and the school committee over the past year. Dr. Bodie is constantly keeping the school committee in the loop through emails and phone calls to make sure that we have the latest information. She's also quick to respond to requests and questions that I have had or that the team has had. She has been proactive in making sure that we have information we need in a timely manner. She attends just about every subcommittee meeting that she can, so she is up to date on school committee business. She was an integral piece of the MASC governance project, and her role in that and support of it was vital to the improvement of our relations and how we conduct ourselves. Recommendations. I would like a quick weekly update to school committee members via email that simply tells us what things have been going on in the district this week and what we're spending time on. This would allow us to have more understanding of where time is being spent and if there are places we can help or where we should be involved. Mr. Yes. Dr. Bodie has improved in this area from previous years. Her newsletters are full of information. She regularly emails the school committee on issues of the day. She studies and makes the appropriate recommendations based on administrative, staff, legal, and community feedback. Dr. Bodie regularly comes to our subcommittee meetings and other town school-related functions and encourages the school committee to join her. I would rate her as proficient in this area and meeting expectations. I recommend that the su superintendent sees issues that are arising to let the school committee know on a timely basis rather than have them become larger and harder to rectify. 
and not to dismiss problems as being minority view, but to investigate and, if necessary, come to a revised opinion or conclusion based on new evidence and testimonial reports and to report same to the school committee. Summary, Dr. Bodhi is proficient in core competency one, but there are areas that need improvement to allow for more expedited further discussion at the school committee table for items that are not planned, going as planned, and what to do about that. Okay, for competency area number two, educational professional leadership. The superintendent is active in visualizing and analyzing new ideas, methods, and technologies. She demonstrates understandings of state and federal laws and Department of Education regulations. The superintendent assures that a balanced program of professional development is provided to enhance curriculum, staff performance, and student learning. She inspires all staff to achieve the highest possible professional standards, and she assesses, designs, recommends, and implements curriculum consistent with the mission and priorities of the Arlington Public Schools. The superintendent understands and keeps informed about all aspects of state and national educational activities which have the potential for affecting the Arlington Public Schools. The superintendent develops and implements educational and organizational strategies that are effective in meeting the needs of a diverse student body. Ms. Hein. Dr. Bodie with her administrative team have continuously used data and professional development opportunities to determine the best educational tools and opportunities for student academic achievement. In addition to meeting the requirements for mandated trainings, such as 51A FERPA and anti-bullying, Dr. Bodie and her team have been proactive with RETA and retail compliance, making Arlington one of only seven communities to meet AYP for our ELL students. She has also implemented programs for RTI that have allowed Arlington students to exceed their projected performance on MCAS as measured through the SGPs. Under recommendations, um, I believe Dr. Bodhi should focus her attention on the programs and sports at the middle school level to further close the achievement gap. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Thanks. Mr. Kim. Commendations. The MCAS results show that Arlington is a high achieving district. Overall, the district met PPI targets of 75 in math, ELA, and science. The median student growth percentiles is 53.4 in math and 56.4 in English language arts. Several of our schools were in the top categories on MCAS. A significant amount of professional development is offered to teachers and staff. The participation of teachers in PLCs, professional learning communities, is excellent. It's one of the best professional development uh, tools there is. It's one of the best ways to raise academic achievement for students. The <clears throat> full alignment of ELA and the math curriculum of the Common Core State Standards was completed in the summer of 2013. The district and Dr. Bodhi are to be commended for doing this ahead of many other districts in the state. And uh, we continue to expand participation in advanced placement courses in the high school. The recommendations, I, I, my, my printed uh, remarks, there's all sorts of data in there, but basically we still have work to do to close the academic achievement gap. The student growth percentile uh, in sixth grade math is 47. The student growth percentile uh, uh, on the seventh grade ELA is 38. Student growth, growth percentile on grade 10 math is, is 44.5. We um, have high needs groups, uh, students in IEPs, low income students, ELL students, uh, in smatter, uh, uh, throughout the district in different grades. Fourth grade ELA, um, the student growth percentile uh, is below 48, is 48. The fourth grade Latino student growth percentile is 44.5. And I have a whole list here that I want to bore people with. So there's different pockets in the district the point I want to make, where we have um, <coughs> Title I students, uh, we have ELL students, we have IEP students who are not getting to the same, not making the same academic progress as the rest of our kids. And so we just can't lose sight of that. My recommendations are the other <coughs> side. Thank you, Ms. Starks. Commendations. This is a place where Dr. Bodie excels. She has created a team of administrators and teachers who feel supported and well-led, creating a cohesive team of administrators and educators in the Arlington Public Schools. The work done in this year to get the curriculum to align with the new Common Core and a renewed focus on common assessments for all disciplines are just two examples of achievements in this area. In addition, the work to ensure meaningful and useful professional development experiences for all teachers and specialists has helped many improve their practice and further improve the level of staffing in the Arlington Public Schools. 
The move to ASOP for requesting and assigning substitute teachers has been successful and is an example of how a new technology can help in better running our schools. In leading by example, Dr. Bodie's participation in the superintendent's induction program shows teachers that we can all improve our practice and should seek out ways to do that. Recommendations. For future professional development, I would survey the staff to find out what they most want and see if it is possible to meet those needs. Thank you, Mr. Hamm. Pass. Commendations. Dr. Bodie encourages and fosters professional development opportunities for staff. She understands the need for teachers to learn as well as to teach, especially given the mandate to align to the Common Core Framework, develop and implement the new educator evaluation system, and to further excel in their practice. Dr. Bodie comes to the job as an educator and curriculum experienced individual. There's a stable, professional, and productive working relationship between the superintendent and the union. I'm pleased with the 2013 MCAS results of our students. General, recommendations. I have some concerns and need further information about the new kindergarten curriculum and its rollout. I'd like to see us updated more regularly on technology plan and to have a short summary of it for the community to review and give feedback on. Also, further work needs to be done in furthering the trend of overall improvement in the areas of ELA, math, and science and AMCAS. I would rate the superintendent as proficient in core competency 1.2. Moving on to three, general right. district management. Dr. Ellison Ampey, you are next. <laughs> Sorry. Commentation. I commend the superintendent on the enhanced program of professional development that was seen in this past year. Uh, this will help our teachers help our students in their achievement. I also commend the superintendent in keeping abreast of the changing picture that is our state's educational activity. For recommendations, I recommend that the superintendent put more emphasis on analysis of new ideas, whether they be results for a pilot study or discussion of cur new curriculum directions, and then to communicate these, the results of this analysis to the school committee and to the public. I also recommend that the superintendent more closely oversee any proposals for new approaches, such as the language immersion initiative. She is the one to ensure that all appropriate questions are being asked and the information is being obtained, including financing, before putting such topics on the table. It's also necessary to present how new initiatives fit into the entire picture of the Arlington Public Schools. Thank you. Number three, general district management. The superintendent makes a concerted effort to reach out to all cultural, racial, and linguistic groups in the school system. She identifies opportunities to improve organization's performance and facilitates constructive change. The superintendent provides an environment, culture where creativity, exchange of ideas, responsible risk taking, and experimentation are shared, valued, and practiced. And she maintains high standards of ethics, honesty, and integrity. Mr. Slip. Yes. Mr. Slip. I commend the superintendent for the completion of the Thompson School on time and on budget. I commend the superintendent for completion of the NEAS for overseeing the completion of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges Accreditation Board. And I commend her for accelerating the tech plan. Uh, recommendations. I understand from a conversation I had uh, that Dr. Boyd is visiting classrooms more and accompanying principals on learning walks. I would like to hear more about it, uh, and I, I'm going to add to my remarks here. I'm supposed to tell you that the chair said to do that. So <clears throat> I, I, I wanted to, I'm talking about a conversation at a high level. I'm not asking you to say so and so <laughs> perform this way. But I think, I think it would be good to hear kind of at a high level what you're hearing out there, your experience. Thank you, Ms. Starks. Um, commendations. Several district initiatives, ASOP and Atlas Rubicon, have helped to better organize and serve the district, but none more so than the move to a centralized registration process for all new students. This central registration allows the district to better understand where new students are and how best to serve their needs. Students can be placed to better level class sizes, and class and school needs are now known more immediately with administration. Dr. Bodhi continues to improve the district's response to the many languages other than English spoken in Arlington homes. For recommendations, I would like to see a report on how we are doing with the translation of notices and information into the many languages other than English that are spoken in Arlington homes. Thank you, Mr. Hamm. Pass. Commendations. We've met our district goal of increasing the diversity of our staff, and our superintendent and human resources director should be commended. The superintendent worked very hard to make sure that the Thompson School opened on time and on budget. 
The superintendent should be commended about the work she and our interim high school principal and staff put into the New England Association of Schools and Colleges survey and the review of the letter and recommendations that was issued in the spring took a lot of time and energy. The STEM computer lab that opened at the high school was a step in the right direction. Our food management services are very good and run on budget. I'm impressed about the completion of district goals 2.1 and 2.2. The superintendent worked closely with the Arlington Teachers Association and the Arlington Administration Asso Administrators Association to create and ratify an educator evaluation system that is consistent with the new DESE guidelines and is currently being implemented. Dr. Bode understood the importance of providing at least four professional development experiences over the last school year to support teachers and administrators in the implementation of this new system. Recommendations. I would like to hear more about the diversity of our staff, our students, and how we're making sure that our English language learners are growing and thriving. Dr. Bode is proficient in core competency 1.3. Dr. Allison Amber. I commend the superintendent on her collaborative approach. The cooperation between our schools and the lack of acrimony greatly contributes to a healthy professional culture, which is attractive to teachers and helpful for students. I also commend the superintendent on the increased recruitment this year of teachers of diverse backgrounds, which better reflect the diverse backgrounds which comp comprise our students. And I'm going off text here. I've also was reminded by Judge. Um, I bragged just yesterday to friends about the food serve, our food service, um, to friends from Newton who are not nearly so happy. Um, they, they would like to know where you go. Um, under recommendations, where, when there is a suggestion or mention of a potential problem, either by school committee or by a member of the community, I recommend that the superintendent be pro, more proactive in identifying the issue of concern. More research should be done by the administration to clarify the size and the scope of the problem through discussions with principals and possibly serving the staff or parents and our parents. Ultimately, the issues need to be reported to the school committee. Examples of this type of problem would be reports of inadequate snow removal, reports of foul odors from the, in the bishop classrooms, and reports of heating and cooling problems at the dome. Um, for commentations, Dr. Bode has developed a strong administration team that encourages the exchange of best practices. Teachers are encouraged to be continuous learners and to experiment with their instruction in the best interest of the students. There are many programs offered as resources to student caregivers. For recommendations, Arlington has a diverse population and Dr. Bode needs to expand the outreach to non-English speaking and public school families. Um, and also continuously review and expand the methods for the greater community outreach. Number four, personnel management. The superintendent develops and oversees the execution of sound personnel procedures and practices and applies procedures and techniques as required by contract and law in the supervision of staff. She clearly defines roles and responsibilities of central office employees and other administrators. The superintendent sets high, consistent expectations and standards for effective staff performance and holds every employee accountable for meeting them. She obtains input from parents, staff, and community groups when hiring key administrators, such as principals, assistant superintendents, etc. She works effectively with collective bargaining units to ensure high quality teaching and learning in our schools. Mr. Slick. Yeah. Mr. Thielen. I commend the superintendent for hiring a new high school principal or a new principal at the Hardy School. I commend her for implementing the new educator evaluation guidelines, and I commend her for implementing the new evaluation framework for principals. No recommendation by this one. Ms. Starks. Commendations. Dr. Bodie is quite adept at her management of district personnel. She has taken part in numerous negotiations with our unions and has overseen the hires of several outstanding administrators. Her hiring continues to be inclusive of staff, parents, and community groups who are affected and ensures a level of openness and inclusiveness in those hires. Work is progressing on ensuring that every district level employee has a clear job description and gets timely reviews and feedback on the job that they are doing. This is on top of the need to move to the new teacher evaluation system required by the DESE. Through the professional development opportunities in the district, she has worked to ensure that the quality of teaching and learning in our schools continues to improve. Recommendations. I would like to see a timeline for when we can expect to see all job descriptions completed and approved. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Pass. Commendations. Dr. Bodie is strong in this area. She's hired an excellent staff and conducted four major administration searches. Community forums were conducted to aid in these searches. 
The ASOC was successful in requesting and assigning substitute teachers and for employee absence reporting. The superintendent should be commended in requesting and advocating for an increase to our substitute pay scale, putting Arlington in line with what other communities are, are doing. Recommendations. Stronger oversight should be put in place to make sure errors or, and omissions do not happen. When and if they do happen, I'd like regular reports on how the district is responding to them. I'd like reports on how the educator evaluations are going, if principals are completing them on time, or if there are any issues that have arisen or need to be addressed. Summary, Dr. Bodhi is proficient and is meeting expectations in core competency 1.4, but needs to improve the protocols and procedures to make sure that errors which could have been provided by prop, uh, prevented by proper oversight may be reduced and hopefully eliminated. Dr. Alice Mann. I commend the superintendent on the hiring of a new high school principal and new Harding principal. I also commend the superintendent on last year's search for a new special education director, although ultimately the search did not succeed because the other district wouldn't let them go. The quality of the candidates brought forward this year was much better, which bodes well for our future. Recommendations. I recommend that the superintendent better communicate to the school committee how key administrators are helped to grow in their roles. In a way that doesn't violate confidentiality, I would like to hear more about how performance is assessed and how the central administration is helping our key administrators improve their management and their communication skills. While recognizing that the structure of certain departments in Arlington is confusing, I recommend that the superintendent do more towards clarifying these department needs, I'm talking about IT and facilities, and communicating these needs to the school committee and to the public. Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Under commentations, um, Dr. Bodhi has successfully recruited and hired new administrators to the district. She's used technology to um, ensure evaluations and deadlines are being met more consistently than any previous years. In addition, Dr. Bodhi has taken a more active role in mentoring the administrators to ensure inter-rated reliability. Dr. Bodhi also creates a supportive environment that allows personnel to grow professionally and continue their commitment to the Arlington Public Schools. Um, I consider this an area of strength and have no recommendations in this area. Thank you. Moving on to number five, core competency, community and public <laughs> relations. The superintendent strives to maintain community respect and support for the school system, promotes, par promotes partnerships among parents, businesses, and other community agencies, and assesses the needs of parents and community members and involves them in decision making. The superintendent is an effective spokesperson for the school district, and she works effectively and cooperatively with other town leaders and agencies. She plans, initiates, and carries out activities to inform community of the mission, goals, and accomplishments of the system, and responds effectively to identified problems of all groups and individuals. Starting with Mr. Phil. Uh, I commend the superintendent <coughs> on the completion uh, and approval of the redistricting plan. I commend her for strong relations with town leadership. Um, she has made the town and other leaders in our community aware of our growth and needs, including the need for a new high school. Uh, <clears throat> I commend her for the implementation of Alert Now. I commend her for regular newsletters and communications to parents. I commend her for being very visible in the community, captures at all the events that, that happen in this town. Uh, <clears throat> under recommendations, I uh, urge her to continue the effort to diversify our staff, uh, and I'm going to add one more that's not going rogue, Karen, that, <laughs> and, that, and that is, and I made this recommendation before, is that I, um, I would encourage the superintendent to uh, have discussions at school committee meetings around, uh, solely around the challenges the district might face in any one area, whether it's special ed or closing achievement gaps and something like that, because that would be a great way for us to learn what the district is doing and also as a way to leverage it could be a way to leverage improvements inside the district. Thank you. Ms. Starks. Commendations. This past year has seen a high level involvement with town officials and appointees that is to be commended. Dr. Bodie has ensured that the town is kept up to date on school needs and accomplishments and has worked to ensure that the schools are being included in conversations that affect them. Her monthly updates to the community highlight the great things happening in the Arlington Public Schools. Her work to improve the information available on the district website has helped many to have the information that they need. Dr. Bodhi consistently ensures that the entire district is thought of as a cohesive whole. Dr. Bodhi attends community events and supports Arlington as a community 
in addition to attending school functions. Recommendations. I would like to see the websites of all schools conform to a standard so that navigating them is easy for parents regardless of the school their child or children attend. I would also like to see a review of all after school programs housed in our schools to ensure that equity is maintained in space, cost, and expectations for all. Mr. Yes, commendations. Dr. Bodie attends many school and town events and is always ready to talk and answer questions. Her monthly newsletters are informative and very interesting to read. The town meeting book was well done and provided to the community on the district's website. Recommendations. I would like to see a review undertaken of the fees of the rentals of school space and accounting of those that are long-term renters. I understand this has commenced and that is a good start, and these have not been reviewed for years. I would like to see, in conjunction with the Community Relations Subcommittee and the School Committee, a revised and modernized website and would and have the schools all have equally modern websites that are easy to navigate and update. I'd like to see more use of the talent resources we have of the members of our community who may be willing to spend some of the time of their time and share their energies to improve in areas that we are lacking. Summary, Dr. Bodie is proficient in core competency 1.5. Dr. Allison Ann. I commend the superintendent on her reporting of the many positive activities that occur every day in our schools. She has been a very effective communicator for this important aspect of our district. I also commend the superintendent on her newsletters, which also highlight many aspects of our schools. And finally, I commend her on attending many, so many of our school functions, something which is supportive of staff and conveys caring to our parents and our students. Under recommendations, I recommend that the superintendent pay more attention to obtaining and maintaining better data to aid in communications about the needs of our schools. Examples include class sizes of, at the middle and high school, the numbers of directed study, the numbers of students per teacher in specific subject areas. I also recommend that the superintendent create a uniform method of reporting class sizes at the elementary school level and ensure it's used by both APS administration and by the elementary schools. This would eliminate the appearance of ineptitude and the confusion and anger that occur when parents are hearing different class size numbers from the teacher, the principal, and the central administration as occurred this past summer as has occurred in prior years. Thank you, Ms. Hunt. Dr. Bodhi has shown continual growth in this area. Through the work of redistricting and the budget, she effectively seeks out community partners to work in the best interest of the school system. She has also successfully oversaw a rebuild and is developing support for additional capital improvements. Dr. Bodhi is a visible advocate for the school system and is present at many community events. Under recommendation, um, Dr. Bodhi should continuously seek means for communicating with community members who are not tech savvy. <laughs> And uh, the last one under core competencies, business and finance operations. The superintendent effectively plans for all the financial needs of the school system, including program staff, facilities, equipment, and supplies. She controls expenditures with a high degree of efficiency within budget limitations and obtains maximum return on investment. The superintendent, either individually or through a member of her staff, provides clear, concise presentation and explanation of the budget and budget process. She informs the school committee of the budgetary implications of administrative decisions in a timely manner. The superintendent and her staff keep the school committee informed of the district's financial status and budgetary implications of administrative decisions in a timely manner. The superintendent oversees the development and execution of procedures to assure the safe and orderly maintenance of all facilities. She communicates with school building committees and effectively manages all school-related capital projects. Ms. Starks. Commendations. Budgets, funding, and budgetary implications of decisions made have never been more transparent than they are currently in the Arlington Public Schools. Improved processes and tools for handling this work are a welcome addition. Her work with town officials on the needs for the physical maintenance and work on the schools has been thoroughly, thorough and timely and has helped to ensure that there is consistent and timely information. Her work on the Thompson rebuild was exemplary and helped to ensure the opening of the school on time and on budget and proves as a shining example of what we can do when we work together with the town and community for the schools. Through work done under her, we were able to eliminate the fees for kindergarten and consequently bring in more money for the town. Recommendations. I would like to see a high level report for each school that outlines the physical state of each building and the plan for the next five years for maintenance, updates, and repair. This report should be updated yearly. Thank you, Mr. Hammes. 
combinations. The elimination of kindergarten fees was an accomplishment, as was the ongoing process of updating the job descriptions. <coughs> Recommendations. I want to see more information about the state of our buildings and what needs to be done to keep them in good shape. I'd like to see an organized vision for the plan of the Stratton in the high school, as well as direction on whether or not the middle school will, will be large enough to hold any increased enrollment numbers we're witnessing now at the elementary levels. Summary. The superintendent is proficient in core category competency 1.6. Dr. Allison Emmy. I commend the superintendent on the smooth final construction phase of the Thompson and that the project came in on time and under budget. In a financially constrained district such as Arlington, being able to make every dollar count is a wonderful asset. Recommendations. As previously mentioned, I recommend that the superintendent create create and maintain better data that captures in numbers aspects about our students' life at the middle and high schools. This will enable more informed decisions at budget time. I also recommend that the superintendent enhance communications with town officials at Long Range Planning via two actions. First, by preparing concise handouts conveying information highlights, for example, the AHS facilities needs. And second, by ensuring that all members of the school committee obtain pertinent information in advance of these meetings so we can better speak to the school's issues. Finally, when questions about budgeting and the override constraints occur, I recommend that the superintendent herself seek clarification with the town manager and begin this communication well in advance of budget presentations. This would avoid situations such as what occurred by the, with the special education increases in the past budget cycle. Oh, and I agreed with Ms. Stark's idea to have a high-level report on facilities needs and update. Thank you, Ms. Hunt. Um, Dr. Cody has shown growth in this area. Schools are completed on time, and buildings and improvements um, are being planned for the future. Dr. Cody, in conjunction with her staff, have built community confidence in the <coughs> district's management of funds. Under recommendations, um, Dr. Bode should consider long-range planning that focuses on the direction of the district and not on the available funding. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Mr. Filmer. I commend the superintendent for the role she played in the elimination of the all-day kindergarten fee, for the implementation of the center registration for new students in our district, and for some of the and for many of the capital improvement projects in the district, including the, including the replacement of the HVAC system on this floor. My recommendation is that the major focus of the school district in terms of construction and expansion over the next several years be the high school, and therefore it is important that the superintendent and her staff develop a FAQ frequently asked question document regarding the MSBA process and the process by which we will seek funds and support from the town. Thank you. Section two, strategic goals. Strategic goal one, the Arlington Public Schools overarching goals. The Arlington Public Schools will ensure that every graduate is prepared to enter and complete a post-secondary degree program, pursue a career, and be an active citizen in an ever-changing world by offering a rigorous, comprehensive, standards-based, and data-driven K-12 system of curriculum, instruction, and assessment that integrates social, emotional, and wellness support. Goal categories, student achievement. There are four of them. Number one. Using Atlas Rubicon software, complete the alignment of the APS curriculum with the Common Core Stan Standards, CCSS, and the World Instructional Design and Assessment Standards, WIDA. In English language arts and mathematics, as well as subjects impacted by CCSS. Number two, reduce the achievement gap by attaining an annual PPI score of 75 or greater for high need <coughs> students at every school. Number three, improve student achievement by attaining a student growth percentile SGP of 51 or greater at each grade level in English language arts and mathematics. Number four, create or identify two common assessments at every level in all disciplines to measure student progress in order to maintain high expectations for learning, teacher consistency, and common focus on instruction. We start with Mr. Hayne. I'd like to, uh, to brief comment at the beginning. My ratings and comments are based on evidence that the superintendent has given to the school committee and district goal work plan. I do not question the superintendent's veracity, but evidence is just that, specific examples of what has been accomplished. Much of what has been provided are statements of what has or was done, are specific examples. In the subcategories, there are four ratings. Uh, did not meet, uh, some progress, significant progress, met and exceeded. And then there is an overall rating uh, for each for the goals, which would be unsatisfactory needs improvement 
proficient or exemplary. Uh, under the first subcategory, which was using the Atlas Rubicon, uh, the evidence provided uh, were PF professional learning community cover sheets, nine of them attached with SMART goals and three common assessment sheets. One sheet from Ms. Kerry Dunn attesting to the alignment of the Common Core using Atlas Rubicon. Uh, through a college acceptance and matriculation report, class of 2013, and Arlington Public School District Hold Work Plan, a statement of work done by teachers during the year. The only comment, the only document that is related to this goal was from Kerry Dunn. The evidence supports the alignment in the social studies department. I rated this subcategory as some progress. The second one, uh, reducing the achievement gap by the annual PPI score of 75. The evidence, the 2012 account accountability data from DESE and the Arlington Public School District goals were plan. This goal was only met in five of our schools, one of which did not have a significant population to report on. I rated that kid not meet. The third one, improvement student achievement by attaining student growth. Uh, the evidence provided provide supports that there has been significant progress in attaining this goal. I'm still concerned about the math scores in the middle school. We have invested money, professional development, and staff. We have, have all had this as an issue for the last three years. I rated this one as significant progress. And the fourth one, create and identify two common assessments at every level. Uh, the evidence that was provided seems to meet the goal. I would ask the superintendent to have all the work listed in the work plan available for the public to see perhaps on our web site. I rated that one as this sub-goal as being met. The overall rating I rated as needs improved. Thank you. Com commendations. Coming into this year, I was concerned the MCAS results from 2011-2012, which showed deficiency in math learning, particularly at the middle school. Dr. Bode deserves credit, as does the OMS math department staff, in working effectively to meet the changing demands during the school year. In the summer, there were numerous meetings to update curriculum and to develop the initial diagnostic. As a district, we met goals 1.2 as five of our eight schools with high needs populations met the annual target and we realized improvements in our math score, MCAS scores. Dr. Bode and staff are to be commended in realizing strategic goals 1.4 because at least two common assessments at each grade level and course have been developed and implemented. I recommend that we need to make sure our high needs learners at the high school and the middle school and bracket attain an annual PPI of 75 or greater. Further professional learning communities work in most grades must continue. For our budget planning process, this should be thought about and recommends, recommendations made to the school committee and the community of what resources need to be deployed to assure the completion of this goal. Dr. Bode should address, watch, and address and watch not meeting strategic goal 1.3 in grade seven, which is now grade eight, and grade four at the Dallin, now grade five. Continue to align the DDMs and report out to the school committee periodically on the process. Add STEAM to STEM. The arts can play a crucial role in the learning and success of our students. I'd like to see Dr. Bode take the lead in this effort in encouraging the use of dance, visual arts, drama, and music to foster better understanding of core concepts in math, ELA, and the sciences. Dr. Alex May. I commend the superintendent on the alignment of the curriculum with the Common Core Standards and for identification of common assessments in all disciplines. I also commend her on improvements in the PPI scores and growth scores. The improvement of student growth in math at OMS in the sixth grade is especially noteworthy. Even it, though it didn't make um, quite to 50%, it went up from 35 by 12 points, which is a lot. Recommendations. I recommend that the superintendent report more on what steps are being taken to address our high needs students whose PPI scores were below 75. I note that although five of our eight schools met the goal of 75, the remaining three schools comprise over 60% of our high needs population. I feel it is worrisome that so many of our high needs students are not achieving on a similar level. I also recommend that we need to take the curriculum mapping to the next level and make it available in a summary form for the public so that the parents can know what to expect for their children. Finally, given the new evaluation timeline, I recommend that attention be paid to ensuring appropriate student performance data is available in a timely fashion for the school <coughs> committee when it comes time to set the annual school committee district goals. Thank you. Ms. Hine. Um, the commendations, I will commend the superintendent on the core competencies. Um, pretty much 
when we look at the list every year of our graduates, they're going to fine colleges, usually their first choice. Um, and we continue to use the data to make those informed decisions. Under recommendations, um, I also think that we need to continue to focus on the areas of greatest need, particularly the middle school and our at-risk students. And we're going to see um, an expansion of focus and resources for that population. Thank you, Mr. Schlicker. Okay, goal one, student achievement 1.1, using Atlas Rubicon software. Significant progress. Evidence. Evidence presented to the school committee indicates significant progress toward the goal. My sense of the goal is too expansive to be able to present enough evidence to document fully meeting this goal, which is why I rated it as achieving significant progress. Comments. It's an expectation that this curriculum alignment will lead to improvements in PPI and SGP for the 2013-14 school year. 1.2. Reduce the achievement gap. Evidence uh, rating significant progress. Evidence for schools, Hardy, Stratton, Pierce, and Thompson had annual PPI scores below 75 in 2012 and raised them above 75 in 2013. Two schools, the Odyssey and Arlington High, had annual PPI scores below 75 and a cumulative uh, PPI score below 75. Comments progress is significant. Recognizing that we will still have a significant way to go before we meet the cumulative PPI in all nine schools in the district. Uh, 1.3 improves student achievement by attaining a student growth percentile of 51. Evidence grade levels where the SGP does not meet the 51st percentile threshold in 2013. Grade 6 math was 47.0, though it was 35.0 in 2012. Grade 7 English Language Arts, 38.0. It's down from 47.0 in 2012. Grade 10 Math, 44.5. Down from 55.0 in 2012. Grade 7 ELA improved from 47.0 in 2012 to 53.0 in 2013. Comments last year, the MCAS presentation and the subsequent presentations by the District Math Director highlighted a sense of urgency in moving middle school math scores. While grade six math did not meet the threshold, there was a significant improvement in the growth scores. The decline in grade 10 ELA is a concern, and I anticipate a continued sense of urgency that will lead us toward having high growth scores in every grade, in every school. Uh, that's goal one, and an overall rating for goal one, proficient. I refer the uh, committee and the chair and the uh, secretary <coughs> to my commendations and recommendations under core competency to education professional leadership. I answer everything that's said. Thank you. Ms. Stark. Commendations. Work completed to align our curriculum with the common core standards and focus in each discipline to define and use common assessments means that students are seeing teachers who are working together at a more cohesive level than ever. There is nothing that strengthens teaching and consequently learning more than allowing teachers to work together to plan and execute their curriculum. This year we saw this in every department, so it is really no surprise that we saw a reduction in our achievement gap and an increase in PPI on state assessments. Recommendations. I would like to see us to continue to focus on common assessments and ensure that departments continue to have time to work together to offer the best instruction and curriculum design for our students. We also need to focus on efforts to improve math in the middle school. Thank you, Ms. Stark. St strategic goal number two. The Arlington Public Schools will recruit, hire, retain, and build the capacity of, of a diverse staff to be excellent teachers and administrators by providing high quality professional development aligned to needs, instructional support, coaching, and an evaluation framework that fosters continuous improvement. There are four strategic sub-goals under staff excellence and professional development. Strategic goal 2.1, working with the AEA and the AAA, create and ratify an educator evaluation system consistent with the new DESE guideline to be implemented in 2013-2014. I can't say this. Strategic goal 2.2, provide at least four professional development experiences over the year to support teachers and administrators in future implementation of new educator evaluation systems. 
provide every teacher and specialist with at least one professional development experience designed to deepen their knowledge of content and differentiation strategies. And 2.2, provide professional development for teachers and administrators on iPad technology and instructional integration of technology to improve teaching and learning. Commendations, Dr. Bodie deserves credit for completing these strategic goals. Work over the year to implement the new e educator evaluation system will ensure that all teachers and staff get fair and frequent evaluations and the support they need to continuously improve their skills. Dr. Bodie has also taken part in negotiation sessions to define how this will look and how it will be implemented. Our staff diversity continues to improve. Professional development for all teachers and staff was offered that not only allowed them to deepen their content knowledge, but also improve their ability to differentiate instruction. Professional development aimed at the use and integration of technology in our classrooms will help motivate students to further their learning. Recommendations. Include input of all staff in decision-making process, especially when it affects significant changes to curriculum. I'd like to see us continue to improve on the diversity of the staff hired, Dr. Allison. I commend the superintendent on the creation and ratification of the new educator evaluation system. This is a major achievement, one that many districts are struggling to attain. I appreciate also that it was done in a collaborative and respectful manner. For recommendations, I recommend to the superintendent that the next set of professional development goals focus more on what educational objective is to be achieved, not on how many days of professional development are supplied. Although I recognize in the past there may have been less professional development, I think we're ready to take this to the next level and think more about assessing what is learned rather than counting how much time is spent in the process. Thank you. Ms. Hunt? I also commend the superintendent, Dr. Bodhi, on the work achieved with the new educator evaluation tool um, and also for the recruitment and hiring that has been continuously going on. Under recommendations, um, there is always the need to continue our outreach to find more candidates of color, um, more candidates that represent the diversity of our community. Thank you, Mr. Schlick. Goal 2, Staff Excellence and Professional Development 2.1, working with the AEA and AAA, uh, exceeded um, Evans AEA Contract Arlington Evaluation website comments. Arlington has developed a reputation for being in the forefront of thoughtful, progressive implementation of the new educator evaluation system. As a non-race at the top district, our being in the lead means we surpass other districts with a one-year head start in the process. The collaboration between the AEA and the district sets the standard for building a thoughtful evaluation process. Uh, 2.4, uh, provide professional development for teachers and administrators, uh, rating met uh, the goal, uh, evidence extensive training and rollout of iPad technology, professional development that correspond to the opening of Thompson School. Overall rating, goal two, proficient. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I refer uh, everyone to my uh, commendations and recommendations under four core competency personnel management. Thank you, Ms. Sparks. Commendations. Work over the year to implement the new teacher evaluation system will ensure that all teachers and staff get fair and frequent evaluations and the support that they need to continuously improve their skills. Dr. Bodie has been an integral part of making this work and has taken part in negotiation sessions to define how this will look and how it will be implemented in the Arlington Public Schools. Our staff diversity continues to improve. Professional development for all teachers and staff was offered that not only allowed them to deepen their content knowledge, but also improve their ability to differentiate instruction. Professional development aimed at the use and integration of technology in our classrooms will help motivate students to further their learning. Recommendations. As stated previously, I would like to see a survey of the staff for future professional development to find out what they most want and see if it is possible to meet those needs. I would also like to see us continue to improve on the diversity of the staff hired. Thank you, Mr. Hanger. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, 2.1, working with the Allenton uh, Teachers Association and Administrators is developing the education evaluation system. My rating is exceeded expectations. I participated in the process and feel that the superintendent and her staff are to be commended in the job well done, going well beyond what was expected of them. 2.2, providing at least four professional development experiences over the year to support teachers and administration. I rated this exceeded expectations. 
Please show the many excellent offerings to help the staff through a new and sometimes frightening program. 2.3, provided every teacher and specialist with at least one professional development experience. I created this as met this goal subcategory. Um, the, it's self-evident the evidence that was provided. 2.4, provided professional development for teachers and administrators on iPad technology. Uh, this goal was met. My overall rating, oh, I would, one comment I would ask the superintendent to include staff evaluations of the seminars in the future as part of the supporting evidence. I, overall rating is proficient. Strategic goal number three, the Arlington Public Schools will offer cost-effective education that maximizes the impact of taxpayer dollars and utilizes best practices, academic research, and rigorous self-evaluation to provide students and staff the resources, materials, and infrastructure required for optimum teaching and learning in a safe and healthy environment. There are four strategic subcategory goals. 3.1, resources, infrastructure, and educational environment. Develop a need statement and potential actions that addresses planning for the future of the Arlington Public Schools with emphasis on the high school, middle school, Stratton, and preschool. 3.2, complete the non-construction planning and purchases, which includes furniture and technology infrastructure and the relocation plan for the new Thompson Elementary School. 3.3, Implement an automated system, ASOP, for requesting and assigning substitute teachers and attendance reporting. N3.4, implement, st implement state health regulations outlined in the Healthy Hunger Free for Kids Act, HHFKA. Dr. Allison Ampey, we'll start with you. I commend the superintendent on the completion and the opening of the Thompson, as previously mentioned. I also commend her on the implementation of the ASOP program and on the implementation of the Healthy Hunger Free for Kids Act. Under recommendations, I recommend to the superintendent to utilize things like the facilities need statement more fully as a way to communicate important school problems to the public. There was a missed opportunity in the need statement as presented in that it did not give enough information to succinctly capture and convey the facilities needs or to highlight the most important parts. Thank you. Ms. Hunt? Under commendations, the superintendent, Dr. Bodie, has done a good job. Oh, sorry, see my voice. Paul Reber. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Bodie has done a good job of ensuring that the buildings have been opened on time and that she is looking towards at, towards sending our resources in the correct direction and provides a cost effective education for all Arlington students. Under recommendations, um, I would like to see Dr. Bodhi work more with the five-year planning process to make sure that there continues to be that focus on cost-effective education. Thank you, Mr. Schlick. Uh, goal three, indicator 3.2, complete the non-construction planning purchases. Thompson uh, uh, met uh, the evidence is a successful opening of Thompson. Uh, implement the automated system in ESOP. Uh, rating met. Uh, overall rating goal three proficient. Thank you, Mr. Phil. What I want to say is covered under my remarks under core competencies three and six. Thank you. It starts. Commendations. System-wide improvements have helped the district run smoother and smarter, including centralizing new student registration and the new ASOP system for finding and assigning substitutes. Needs assessments for the middle school, high school, and Stratton buildings are ongoing and the Thompson School renovation was completed on time and on budget. Recommendations. As stated earlier, I would like to see a high-level report for each school that outlines the physical state of each building and the plan for the next five years for maintenance, updates, and repairs. This report should be updated yearly. Thank you. Mr. Hanner. 3.1, develop a needs statement. Uh, the rating I gave was met, and uh, I would ask the superintendent to continue this work so that all our schools are 20th, 21st century schools. 3.2, complete the non-constructive planning, which includes future technology. It's things that, you know, was, this goal was also met. 3.3, uh, implement an automated uh, system ASOP. This goal was met. I have personal experience using this program in neighboring districts, and I find it easy and useful, bene and, useful and beneficial. 3.4, implement the state health regulation. This goal was met. I found uh, the major part of the evidence in our own policy file, and I would commend the policy group with Dr. Uh, Bodie's help in uh, 
writing this policy, overall rating for fishing. Commendations. The Thompson School opened in September. It was on time and on budget. The superintendent and her leadership team worked together to make decisions on what are the right resources and materials and infrastructure to bring into the district. I'm pleased that Dr. Bodie contracted with the Boston Company on-site insight to perform an audit that resulted in recommendations of immediate action for our capital and energy needs at the high school. Dr. Bodie and our health and wellness kitchen staff are to be commended on a wide variety of nutritious offerings the policy and rollout of the new nutrition policy and a, and a fiscally sound meals program. Arlington submitted documentation and was approved last year for an additional six cents funding per reimbursable meal for meeting the requirements of the federal HHFKA. Recommendations. I do not remember seeing the results of the planning on potential reconfiguration of existing space at the office. I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see a one or two page need statement summary and actions for the schools, with particular emphasis on the high school, Audison, Stratton, and preschool. We've talked about the needs of these buildings, but I think a sh concise summary statement that highlights the major problems and suggested solutions is crucial to get the town behind any efforts of renovation. I want to see more updates on STEAM initiatives, technology plan, and the facilities plans in the media, as well as at our meetings. I'd like to see surveys and town hall meetings on these very important issues. I'd like to see the technology plan boil down to a short paragraph of goal or goals of what we want for our students. There's definitely room for improvement here. Once we recognize higher enrollment and further unexpected costs due to unfunded mandates, the burden is on us and the superintendent to get the community and stakeholders informed as to what it will take going forward so we do not encounter any large deficits or have to cut valuable programs. I'd like to see more of a speedy and organized approach to that reality. To better document special education cost growth, for example, I'd like to see further leadership and organization around the Stratton High School Audison and their renovation and space limits. I'd like to see better explanation of our special education costs versus our regular education costs and how we're using the town's appropriation in that regard. I'd like to see better long-range planning partnership with town officials. Lastly, folks, to end this uh, discussion before summary statements, strategic goal number four, the Arlington Public Schools will be run smoothly, efficiently, and professionally. The district will operate transparently and engage in effective collaboration and responsive communication with all stakeholders. It will provide timely, accurate data to support financial decision making, envisioning of the district's future, and long-range planning in partnership with other town officials. Through these actions, it will create broad support for a high quality education system in the community that is the community's most valuable asset. There are two sub goals under operations, communication, <coughs> and stakeholder engagement. Goal 4.1 develop a centralized registration process for all new students that incorporates school committee approved redistricting guidelines and is widely communicated to all stakeholders. Goal 4.2 conduct and report the results of a survey of Arlington residents to evaluate the two-way communication of Arlington Public Schools. Ms. Hine, we'll start with you. I actually have nothing to add to either commendations or recommendations that I've not already said under other categories. Thank you, Mr. Schlick. Uh, goal 4, 4.1, develop a centralized registration process for all new students. Met, evidence presentation regarding central registration and school committee meetings, comments. The successful implementation of central registration was essential for the implementation of the new student assignment policy, given the efficient placements of students in elementary schools, this is a critical cornerstone for implementation of the new districts and buffer zones. Um, overall rating goal four, proficient. Thank you, Mr. Kim. I say exactly what Lita said. Ms. Stark. She said it much better than I yeah, but you said it very well. I also have nothing to add in this section that has not already been said. Thank you, Mr. Hanner. Develop 4.1, develop a centralized registration process for all new students. I rated that as met. This was well done. I would recommend that an evaluation sheet be added to the form to give feedback for the future. 4.2, conduct and report the results of a survey of Allen residents who evaluate two-way communication and APS. Uh, statement of the district goals document was uh, not completed. It speaks for itself. This goal uh, was not met. I hope that this is completed as soon as possible. Commendations. Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hanna. The overall rating needs improvement. Commendations. Dr. Bodie tackled 4.1 well with the help of Ms. Leilani D'Agostino. 
Parents seem to like the centralized <coughs> registration. It's easier. It's more efficient. Dr. Bodie's leadership proved invaluable in tackling a decades-old problem of unequal class size in the district. Recommendation. I'd like to see more evidence on how the centralized registration process was widely communicated to all stakeholders. I'd like to have periodic updates on the early results of redistricting with reports on how many students were re redistricted and how many goal point uh, and, and, and goal, why 4.2 wasn't completed. The school committee and superintendent should meet in a retreat and formulate what a survey should look like and what the goals uh, should be for it. Section three, summary comments. Oh, Dr. Allen. <laughs> There's an issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I commend the superintendent yeah. on the development of the central registration process, which has enabled the gathering and reporting of helpful, important information about student population growth. Recommendations, um, as already mentioned in other topics, and also I recommend to the superintendent that the survey be conducted for until communication continues to be a significant area of parent pursuit parental dissatisfaction. Thanks. Summary comments. Um, we will start with Mr. Schlickman. We're going to go around the table and please add what uh, you have missed or would like to input here. This is your chance for the ending. Okay. Overall comments. Given the transition to the new educator evaluation system, I scored the superintendent on the high leverage indicators in which evidence was apparent to the school committee and, and at the community level. Superintendent Bodie has had a successful year leading the Arlington Public Schools. The rollout of the new teacher evaluation system is exemplary and a model for the entire state. Given that Arlington was not an RTTT district and has had a much more relaxed deadlines for developing and implementing the new system, the fact that other districts, including Race the Top Districts, looked to Arlington for leadership is an exemplary outcome. The successful completion of construction and opening the new Thompson School was achieved in what appeared to be a seamless manner. Superintendent and Principal Donovan should be commended for the smooth transition to the new building. Uh, the superintendent's leadership interacting with NEASC helped Arlington to get a report that truly reflects the current state of the education in our high school. The commendation of our teachers and students reflects the substantial work involved in making the high school a great place to learn. She is using the NEASC findings as evidence to demonstrate the urgency of making substantial improvements to the Arlington High facility. There has been progress towards the goals that would bring the district to level one status. The goals are purposefully challenging and in my mind cannot be achieved in one year. There is evidence of purpose and strategic planning and the gains that were made in 2013. No matter how well we do, there is always room for continuous improvement and the superintendent has skillfully committed herself to this task. Superintendent Bodie has also alerted us to the challenges we will be facing due to steadily increasing enrollment. By placing this item before us at almost every meeting, she helps to focus the committee and the community on the problems we need to solve in order to continue to provide a quality education for our children. Currently, the central issues are the steady increasing enrollment and the need to bring the physical plant of our own high school up to the standards required for accreditation. The future of our district depends on the continuation of this work. I rate the superintendent proficient in all four goals and view her overall performance as a superintendent as proficient. Thank you. Mr. Film. <coughs> I've learned in, uh, in uh, school management that we're able to keep recommendations as concise and as, uh, have as few recommendations as possible so that people walk away knowing the, the most important thing. So the, the overall commendation is that I, we have a high-performing school district, and that's because of a high-performing leader in Dr. Bowden. So we have a high-performing school district. We should be uh, happy about that, and I think we are. There's two major recommendations that I want uh, to leave you with. The first is any area where we have, uh, where we're not achieving an SGP of 51, whether it's a subgroup or a grade level or a subject matter, and a, and a, and a, uh, a PPI of 75, is an area that has to be the focus of the superintendent and her staff. And it's a, and it's and it's a common, it's a conversation we should have, protecting people's kind uh, of contractual rights. We should have in public so that we can learn about what the district is doing to address these issues. 
that's my major recommendation one. The second major recommendation is that the big issue facing the Arlington Public Schools over the next one, two, three, four, five years is the, the issues, the physical issues in this building, in this high school. And so I want the superintendent and her staff to make that a high priority and to enlist the support of the school committee and the community to do whatever is necessary to address the concerns raised by the Lincoln Association of Schools and Colleges about this building and to make this uh, a great, smart building for learning for the next 50 years. Thank you. Ms. Tars. Um, overall, this has been a good year for the Arlington Public Schools, and I feel that Dr. Bowring finally has the staff she needs to successfully run the district. With a wonderful team of administrators, teachers, and staff, Dr. Bodie has led the Arlington Public Schools to a more open and cohesive school system. More than ever, things are being handled proactively instead of reactively, allowing the time needed to think through and handle issues and concerns that may arise. Dr. Bodie has fostered a positive working relationship with the unions, which not only allows there to be a discussion and creative thinking around anything that may need attention, but also means a productive relationship that helps move our schools forward. Thank you, Mr. Hamm. I want to commend the superintendent for the Thompson School coming online smoothly, on time, and under budget. Comment, commend the superintendent on the application of the redistrict pro, redistricting program. I did not get one single phone call during this year. Thank you. Negotiating and implementing the new teacher administration and evaluation program. Keeping the school committee informed in a timely manner on all pertinent issues of the Arlington school system and making herself available to members on a timely basis. I recommend that the superintendent consider the following. To continue with the statement of interest of a, of a high school and other facility projects. Work with the committee so that both sides are clear on the evidence supporting the standards and goals for your evaluation in this upcoming year. To continue keeping the committee informed upon, about continued increases in student enrollment. To strive to have a successful search for the special education director that the entire school community will support. <coughs> and lastly, complete the survey of the Arlington residents to evaluate the two-way communication of Arlington Public Schools. This evaluation that I have put together is a hybrid of all the, uh, of the old form and the elements of the new form. I, will not, I do not feel comfortable to do an overall rating at this time. I continue to believe that Dr. Bodie is a caring educator who acts on the best interest of the children's staff and the entire school committee. Community, excuse me. Thank you. I am proud to say the Arlington Public Schools are strong and Dr. Bodie has provided stability and caring and consistent educational leadership. Dr. Bodie does not rest on her laurels, nor does she accept full credit. Like a good leader, she understands that it is a practice of continual improvement that needs to be adhered to and pushes all of us for better results. Dr. Bodie is the first to say that the Arlington Public Schools are strong because of our teachers in our classrooms, the administrators in our buildings, and the parents and guardians and the students themselves. Today, I wish to tell her and the public that we are fortunate to have the leadership of Superintendent Bodie. Dr. Bodie is always looking for community support and the help and volunteerism of the parents and guardians. Last but not least, the Arlington Public Schools is strong because of the continued commitment to excellence and practice that our students exhibit daily. Dr. Bodie has hired the right leaders to help implement her vision of a strong public education system and takes on projects and problems to finish them and make them better. My recommendation is to continue to educate the community about what a 21st century education in Arlington should look like, what it will take and what we already have in place and what we will need. <coughs> My summary comments, Dr. Bodie is proficient and she meets expectations and goals. I'm pleased that last year's numerous and ambitious district goals were over 92% completed. Dr. Allison Ann. I commend the superintendent on her collaborative leadership style, but I remind her at the end of the day, she is still the one responsible for ensuring that the district moves forward. I would like to see more analysis of data and results, whether we are discussing new pilots, new initiatives, or future planning. I would also like to see improved communications with an emphasis on targeted, clear, and concise reports and presentations. Finally, the superintendent is the one who should be bringing a bigger picture view to the table for both educational aims and for thinking about the future. I would like to see more of this in the coming year. Although I greatly appreciate the hard work the superintendent has shown, I feel improvement is almost possible and offer these suggestions in hopes that we can bring our district to the next level of achievement. 
should be the goal. The, the goal is progress and, and, and a commitment to that kind of improvement. You don't want to set the goals that are easy to be achieved because then, like anything in life, if they're too easy, then there's no sense of accomplishment when you achieve them. So I'm very proud of all, all that's going on. In fact, some of the um, reports I have tonight, just more evidence of the um, not say it was a superintendent's report, but uh, of the achievement of our students and our staff. Uh, so I, I, I would want to say to the Arlington community that you really have a, a great public school to be proud of. And, um, and, I, and I, the Hansen sitting here, we've talked a lot about um, union uh, collaborative work, but I give a lot of credit to Linda. She's certainly been a very strong leader. Uh, for uh, the AEA, and uh, and in that collaborative, but honest and frank kind of conversations we've had, I think that we um, are able to work together to really work out <coughs> problems that come up, and that's just na natural. We it's, a, it's all about people, and therefore there are things that come up that need to be worked out. But it's also systems and um, vision of where we are. You had, I was sitting here writing down the recommendations. There are a lot. There are a lot of things here. And I think that it's going to be important for all of us to set some priorities around these. Some of them are in our goals for next this year, and some are not. And we are in a school year that is really a challenge in terms of energy. And I think that we can all say that we are all trying to all trying to do this with equanimity, but it is a lot of challenge in terms of the, the mandates that are upon us from, not within ourselves, not within ourselves we always want to improve, but the mandates that are external to us. And so we are doing, that's where our energies are this year. And there are some things I think are just going to have to wait, such as improved websites, and there's a number of things. But those will all come in time because we all want to see uh, those so um, thank you for your thoughtful comments, and thank you for your partnership as we've been working together. Uh, I think that the governance project certainly was a very worthwhile, and I talked to other superintendents and school committee members that this is a really valuable thing because it's, it's not all about one person, and it's not all about, uh, it's 
really about all the different kinds of teams that focus on what we need to do. And while, thank you for your comments to the Thompson, there's the Thompson School Building Committee, which Jeff served on too. That was a great team of people that worked on that. And by the way, it was not on budget, it was under budget. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Hayes, but it was. And I think that the members of the committee felt very good about that, is to have such a wonderful school to result from all those years of effort. And I suspect as we go forward with the high school and Stratton, and yes, we do have to look at Otteson, um, given what we've experienced this year in enrollment, but you know, we will do this. And uh, I think that there's a commitment on everyone's part that we need to do it, and we will do it as we go forward. The challenge will be, talking about what are the challenges, the challenges are going to be the sequence in which we do it, and, uh, and that will be a community challenge, not just school department challenge as we go forward. So a lot of good suggestions, and uh, I, and the you know, the commendations, I really would like to spread those out to all the people I work with because it really, they deserve a lot of credit for what has happened this last year. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, um, we have an enrollment update projections session, and this correlates to our district goal, 4.1. Mm -hmm. um, the public should know is relating to um, the operations, communication, and stakeholder engagement, and the statement of interest that we are developing for December uh, collaboration with town officials addressing the physical plan of the high school. So this sort of ties in with, with all of that. Well, it certainly is one of the challenges that we face, um, and, and you're going to see that a little bit more in, in Diane's presentation. Um, we did see a large growth in our number of students, particularly at the elementary level, which um, has us thinking again about Addison space, as we should, but also all of the students that will be coming um, through the elementary uh, grades who are going to end up here. And, they're, and, they're, and students, the class sizes that we see right now in fifth grade will be here in four years, which is not much time when you, you know how long these, these processes go. Um, I think a lot of the information about enrollment is going to come out when, when Diane goes through the long range, um, uh, the, the long range look at and where we're going to be in the next few years based on uh, live births. But one thing that is at your place that um, that I just I had I received after the package went out were the, the a summary of the October 1 numbers as they relate in the chart that you like to see about class sizes. The one thing I will say about this chart is that it's the numbers are going to be different than the numbers you're going to see with, with Diane, mainly because these numbers do not reflect out-of-district placement. But anyone, any student who's in an out-of-district placement is part of the uh, our total number of students in the district. So that, I just want to alert you to that. Um, we, with the, num the number that we saw as an increase in students, which was talked about in the newspaper and talked about this table many times, um, 160 as being the number of new students, that number is accurate. You will find, though, that after we've had students move out of district, uh, we've been able to, sometimes parents leave the district and they don't even notify us. Um, and so we find out as we actually get into the school year that they're no longer in the class or on the class list that we have. So the, the adjustments that are made um, are reflected in these documents and in the documents that, um, that Diane is going to go over with everyone. But the message to take from this, all of this about enrollment growth is that it presents a challenge not only in staffing, which is, could potentially be significant as we move forward in the years ahead, but of course in facilities. And I, I think it's right now, at least at the elementary level, just <coughs> long range view, I think we're going to be fine for a number of years. Where the pressure is going to come, we're going to have to look very carefully at us and, and certainly uh, this, this high school as well, because right now, even though it seems like it's a huge building, and it is a huge building, we are, it is filled. And you put another 300 students in here, and that is going to be significantly challenging. 
So why don't why don't we just give you the uh, the presentation, and then I think this will be a good evening to have some discussion about this and um, questions go from there. Okay. Good evening. First of all, I apologize for being late. The Capital Budget Committee met at 5 o'clock and ran over as we were going through public safety issues and other things, so I apologize for being late. Okay, this uh, I'm going to start off to talk about um, the three years of actual expenditures we have now according to the chart of accounts that we implemented in, 19, in uh, FY11, um, which allows us to look at various different categorizations of our expenditures. In prior years, we've done multi-year comparisons based on the end of the year report data because in prior years, that's the only source of data I had. There isn't anything particularly remarkable that happened in FY13. Um, and I think I'll go right ahead to this graphic. This shows, a, broken out by the budget transfer detail categories that are voted by the school committee. On the far left in the blue is um, FY14 budget. The other three years are our actual expenses, 13, 12, and 11. And you can see some of the patterning that one would expect in budgets. We're seeing the growth in elementary education, secondary education, we're seeing the stepped up growth in special education consistent over all time with the 7% growth that we talked about many times. You'll notice in FY13 we did not meet that same step threshold, but we already know that in 14 we're going to exceed budget by a good measure. So over time we hit 7%. We don't hit 7% every year. Curriculum and instruction is showing some modest growth. Administration looks a little artificially down in FY13, and that's predominantly due to the fact that our legal expenses were very low relative to other years in FY13, which is a good thing. Um, it was a non-negotiation year, and other things have settled down. Um, so that's a good thing to see. This is a different view than I'm now able to do because I have the data for three consecutive um, fiscal years with the new chart of accounts. The bright blue is, on the left is general education. The bright green is special education. But in between, the red is something I've tagged as interventions. And this represents the reading, RTI, math RTI, ELL, and other types of supports like this that aren't strictly special ed, but I think are really important to look at. In general, in times of budget crisis, this is an area where one would go to cut because these are the supplementary services, but I think they're absolutely vital to, to helping to contain special ed costs. And you can see that over time, we've been able to invest more and more in these intervention services, which I think is an excellent long-term strategy for making sure that we can keep the special education to the 7% run rate that, that we're hoping to keep it to. The itty bitty purple right here is direct professional development and I have to admit I was shocked when I put it up in numbers and the actual dollars. This doesn't include in service days that are part of the teacher contract. This is just other spending for professional development and when you look at it compared to other items in the budget it, it's rather shockingly small. And administration you can see those costs are not growing in the same kind of rates that that regular ed and special ed and even interventions are. So we're, we're able to do more without growing the infrastructure at the same pace that we're growing other types of expenses. Um, as you know, the multi-year financial plan for the town and the school accommodates a low average special education growth rate of 7%, and we did not meet that in FY13, but many previous years have exceeded it. I believe that we need that 7% year over year to be able to deal with costs in the long run with special education. 
And I want to show you a couple of graphs that I think you've seen before, but I think the point is still important. The dark blue line that's jagged is special education expenditures from FY05 through FY13. It's FY14 based on our, our <coughs> estimates right now. The, the top line is growth from at a 10% rate. The yellow line is growth at 7%, and the purple line is growth at 3.5%. And you can see that in many of the earlier years, special education costs were well exceeding 7%. And in the last few years, have been tracking closer to, you, to it when you look over the long timeline. But if you shorten the, the timeline, starting in FY11 when we implemented the new chart of accounts, the dark blue line is still the special education cost. And you can see that over that period of time, it's exceeding even the 10% growth rate. We're able to make it work with the 3.5 and, and the 7 because we have some flexibility. But thinking that in a good SPED year when we don't come in at 7 that we don't need the difference between where we come in and that 7% is, I think, erroneous thinking because, in, for example, in FY12, our growth rate was 12% and we had to absorb those costs. Special education just does not grow linearly. You know, it, it, it's up, it's down, it's, it's one of those things that's not predictable. And we've cushioned ourselves by creating some reserves. But without that 7% year over year, and we're going to use those reserves this year to cover the uptick in FY14. But without that 7% year over year, we won't ever be able to rebuild the reserves in the good years in order to do that again. The next big issue, as Dr. Brody has said, is enrollment. Um, over the last two years, we have an additional 281 students. But since FY2000, we've added almost 1,000 students to Arlington. That is, that is a lot of pressure on the district, particularly on facilities when you consider that when they, the school rebuilding project was begun, it was expected that the district would hold steady at about uh, 4,200 students and we're way up from there at this point. But we have done some things to try and accommodate that with the redistricting plan. We negotiated a larger Thompson project than was originally suggested by the MSBA and hopefully with the future high school renovation, we'll be able to take that forward. As we look forward with the pressures of enrollment growth, it puts pressure on the multi-year plan in a way that it wasn't envisioned, I think. Um, the multi-year plan is meant to maintain stable services over the years for both town and school, you know, with budgetary restraints so that we can go as long as possible between override votes. Um, it never assumed that there would be large swings in, in population and it doesn't compensate in any way for those kinds of budgetary pressures. Given this enrollment growth and given the confines of the multi-year plan, we could only maintain our budget within the plan. It would inevitably result in the reduction of services to our students. So this is um, the budget growth over time. Through 14, their actual 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 are projected based on a, a five-year weighted survival average from grade to grade. You have the spreadsheet from your packet. Um, it's the same spreadsheet I've been doing for several years. Um, I have to say it doesn't prove to be a particularly excellent predictive tool um, because it depends a lot on what happened in the most recent year. And we, de we did see some flattening out here. Prior to that, things were marching up, and then FY11 and FY12, the growth flattened out, but then 13 and 14 have shot right up again. So, as best as we think, it looks like the growth is steady. One piece of information that I think is particularly concerning is that that calculation is based off the live births in town. And in prior years, and I have the information going back quite a while, live births were generally, you know, 500, 550, somewhere in that range, and then they've crept up to the, you know, 5, 550, and now we're seeing in, uh, in the class that'll be coming into the school system for fiscal 18, it, it's 600 babies. So we're seeing an, exec, an exec, inexorable um, growth in the number of babies we have in town. We're also seeing that the survival rates in the first, third, and fourth grade exceed 100%, which means kids are moving into the district. We're not, even, we're not only keeping all the kids from the prior year, we're adding kids to it. We also add children at the high school as well. 
What are the principal, uh, the principal funding mechanism from the state for education is chapter 70. And the allocation is based on the total population of students, the types of students, the wealth of the community, and how much the state has to allocate in any given year. Chapters, Arlington's chapter 70, as in most communities, has risen in the last four years. Some of this is, moved, is due to the move to full day kindergarten without fees. Um, but even if we back out that change, we're still seeing a pretty, pretty significant growth in Chapter 70. And with the continued upward enrollment pressure, we should see Chapter 70 continue to rise in future years. So in this chart, the blue represents the Chapter 70 allocation from the state from FY11 through 14. The red represents um, the Chapter 70 less the offset for the kindergarten fees, which comes into play in FY13. And the green represents the increase from the prior year backing out the additional revenues that are coming to, to the school department, you know, the 970 that they're offsetting our fees. So you can see that in 13, even though they gave us extra money so that we could stop charging fees, they still realized a growth in Chapter 70 from the prior year. And in 14, when we saw the effect of no longer charging kindergarten fees, we saw a very large uptick. I think it works out to about $2.5 million increase over those three years in Chapter 70 funding. So in order, to, um, in order to deal with the budgetary pressures of increased enrollment, continued growth of regular ed and special ed, um, just normal healthy growth, um, suggestion to possibly mitigate this problem is to look at the number of students that are added in the fall. So for this fiscal year, for FY14, our increase is 134 students as of the time we filed the enrollment report with the state. If we were to multiply that by some growth factor, by per pupil growth factor, which is certainly something to be debated, um, and add that to the FY15 school department base, that would put us in a position where we could thoughtfully plan for the growth that, that may or may not come, I think will come. Um, but we're in, a, we're in a position, if the money comes in in the fall, we can go through the whole budget process knowing that those revenues are available to us. And I believe that less money earlier will do more good than more money later in the budget planning process. To wait until town meeting or till the spring is very late in the game for thinking about scheduling and staffing and how we're going to run the schools for the upcoming year. So I think it's very important, I mean this is just a suggestion on how we could we could modify the multi-year plan, not break the fundamental terms, because I believe the three and a half and the seven percent is really a sound metric for maintaining services, but you know, we, can't, we can't maintain services and grow on the same amount of money. The, um, in subsequent years, it would always be the current year's enrollment change multiplied by whatever that factor is that goes into the next year's base, or if we were to see a drop in enrollment, then by rights that we should see a reduction in the fall into the next year's base, but it gives us time to plan and to deal with that. Thank you. Questions from the committee, Mr. Hamm. Uh, Diane, that uh, slide that you had, the three-year expense history with current year projections, you talked about uh, professional development and uh, this one. Yes, and I didn't quite understand. It, it looks really meager. And it, it, uh, it, I thought we have grown in our professional development. Oh, we have. We have. I mean, we, we, if you can see the numbers down here, we went from 249 to 326. Right. But, but as a portion of budget, it is so tiny, it graphically it doesn't show up. Does that much. include all the stuff that we've done on, on teacher evaluation? And That's retail? direct professional development. You know, any kind of training that, any kind of professional development training. So it, it would count those that we've done this year? Yes. Thank but you. it wouldn't necessarily include equipment that went along with that. When you say equipment. If they had a training in iPad usage in the classroom, okay. it wouldn't necessarily yeah. include the iPad. It would include the training, the trainer, the stipends for that. Any questions? Okay. The reason why we were able to eliminate the kindergarten fee 
is because that increase of enrollment generated so much increase in Chapter 70 money. So that the Chapter 70 money turned out to be more than the fees we were charging. A corresponding 130 some odd increase in students uh, offsetting the uh, uh, the maximum gain in the local contribution would mean that we'd have a nice spike in Chapter 70 money as a result of that increase. But under the terms of the present fiscal stability plan, we don't get the benefit of the additional state funds that are coming to us in order to serve the additional students. And the current terms of the plan that is that is correct. That additional revenue goes to the bottom line and mm -hmm. works to extend the life of the, the plan, pushing out into the future the date when we need to seek another override. Yeah, Which uh, is why, but the suggestion to modify this to compensate for um, to compensate for this growth, because we, we could not continue to absorb this kind of growth without either achieving more revenue or making cuts, and obviously cuts aren't desirable. Um, this Chapter 70 increase pr pr provides a potential source to increase that funding, but I don't, I don't believe it would be in anyone's best interest to completely throw out the multi-year plan. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that at all. However, the, the multi-year plan also did not anticipate the extraordinary increase in Chapter 70 money that was derived from the increase in students. So perhaps the way we should be thinking about this is to somehow come up with a formula that says, okay, if our enrollment were stable, our Chapter 70 would increase by, say, 2%. But because we've got a growing enrollment, our Chapter 70 is increasing by 10%. So that increase of 2%, which would have been a baseline increase, should stay within the formula. But the additional aid on top of that, which is generated purely by the increase in the number of students, should revert back to us for the purposes of educating the, in this case, 134 additional students we're getting this year. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I, I'm a little concerned about the timing of it. So when are we going to know, For you know, I, I seem to recall from last year that we didn't really lock in what our Chapter 70 for FY14 was going to be until very, very late in the game, post-town meeting. Yeah. And that represents, and that's why, that's why I'm nervous about going down that road, because, you know, do we do it two years out so we know exactly what it is and we can plan it in the fall? Do we guess and then we're on fuzzy ground? I, I mean, to my way of thinking, timing is so crucial. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I agree with you. But the timing of that is lousy. Yeah, I like the way you're thinking about this, in that you're looking a, a, a more conservative early number is better than a bigger number late because of the plan. Well, and, and, a, and an unpredictable number is the worst of all. Yes. Yeah. So but we, we really need to have some sort of uh, an adjustment looking at, and not looking to take money out of the, ta uh, the local taxes for this purpose, because I want to stay within that three and a half, seven, uh, configuration, but because the additional students are generating s additional state money specifically for the purpose of educating those additional students, I think that we have to have some sort of a mechanism where that additional Chapter 78 targeted those students ends up being used to increase our capacity for the larger student enrollment. Uh, would it be possible to do it from the year's previous growth. Um, so we know that last year we had uh, 147 new students. So again, going with the similar formula, if we knew that we already know what last year's increase in Chapter 70 was based on those numbers, so would it be possible to influence the next year's by what happened the last year, which is really how it affects us anyway, right? Because well, yes, it's the it's the 13 increase in 147 that helps spark right. the big growth in right. FY14. Right. It wasn't just the loss of the kindergarten fees; it was also the total enrollment growth, right. which is why so that if, performed if, so much uh, better than anticipated. Right. So if if um, so, let's say hypothetically, last year we saw an increase of 10 percent, and we were only expecting that 2 percent. Um, then maybe the town could see its way to saying, okay, then, but we can look back, and that way we always do have the number already for this next year, kind of like what we did with 
it's it's kind of like banking the special uh, the circuit breaker to kind of instead this way we're looking back and we're and then what would it would it would be on the town side for them to say okay whatever the differences that comes in we have to set that aside that's going to go to the schools the next year to offset that that difference just correct me if I'm wrong chapter 79 <coughs> The amount is not guaranteed to go up every year. Correct. We're at the whim of the state. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get an increase in population, we get a slightly bigger percentage of the pie. But if the pie itself has been reduced, we technically could get get less money next year, even though we have 100 plus children. That is so mm -hmm. we got to be very careful. Mm -hmm. This idea of depending on Chapter 70, we've been fortunate. But Mr. Schluck. Yeah, I'm, I'm not depending on Chapter 70. I mean, because I, I was sitting in this chair here in 2004 when the Romney administration came in and cut us all 20% uh, just because they decided they were going to balance their budget on the backs of uh, local governments. Um, it, it was a terrible time. However, you know, there are a couple things we need to understand here. Is the October 1 cap that Diane is reporting now, which is October 1, 2013, is the number that generates the local aid number for fiscal 15. So that there's, uh, there's already a year lag in this. And one of the things the state did the last time they recalculated the formula is to put in an escalator in there to compensate for high growth communities, which all of a sudden we become. So that, that because they are capping our minimum local contribution, uh, the state under the Chapter 70 rules is obligated to fill in the rest of Chapter 78. That's, what, that's what's happening. That's why. When we eliminate kindergarten fees, the aid went up. That's why when our enrollment goes up, the, the, the aid went up. That $2 million increase that, that uh, she's showing is a result of the, you know, a, lot, a lot of that's a result of the increase in enrollment. Now, how, how do you capture that? Uh, I, I think some sort of a formula which recognizes that, uh, you know, on average, uh, the state increased Chapter 78 per pupil by X amount, or their, their whole Chapter 70 pop by X amount. And then taking a ratio between that and our actual increase, the uh, super inflation number, in other words, the number beyond the normal inflation given a steady enrollment, which we can go through the formula and calculate, should sort of be the area where we're capturing the money, because that wasn't considered in the original plan. What happens if our enrollment goes up and Chapter 78 goes up uh, it, it <coughs> progressively in order to compensate for the enrollment. That's all I'm saying, is that uh, if, if our enrollment was steady, the, the three and a half, seven is what we agreed to and very manageable, but since then we've experienced this huge increase in enrollment, and if we have to put in five new classrooms under the three and a half percent cap, uh, <coughs> we're, we're going to be going backwards every year. Dr. Allison, I'm just, okay, so I'm Hadn't, I wasn't able to make the budget meeting, so these numbers are new somewhat. So one thing I'm asking, because I know it's going to be asked by someone out there, is the source of the <coughs> new increased enrollment, or is it the increased special education costs? Because if, if we had not seen a significant uptick in special education costs, would we be able to handle the increase in enrollment? I'm just thinking that if we had 700, you know, to me, the numbers I'm comparing are $700,000 for increased special education versus three or four teachers at 50, 60K for, to cover 150 students. And those, you know, I'm seeing that the big pie is really in the increased special education costs. Well, and so to, to try, I mean, I think it's fine to try and think of how to really deal for more money if possible. <coughs> I'm just saying if we go in and say, well, the problem is this, and really it's not the, the bigger problem is the other. Well, I mean, I think, I think with the 7%, if we're allowed to keep the 7% year over year, I think we can manage the natural special ed growth, which we've shown in our community over time to roughly work out to 7%, roughly. You know, 
or more. But we can work with that. We, can, we can't work with it at three and a half. I mean, you could say that it just absolutely exceeds, you know, three and a half is just unmanageable. That we really do need 7% on special education costs. I think that, I mean, if that is a given, that the seven and the three and a half, we can manage SPED even when in a, an occasional 12% year under those conditions. I think we were able to manage last year's 147 kid uptick because we had an easy SPED year. That created some room. What we can't have is SPED doing seven or better, or way better, and enrollment growth at the same time. You know, and, and so, you know, I think, I think the prudent long-term strategy with managing SPED costs is, again, continued investment in the interventions, you know, to continue to prudently staff and fund all the way along, to, to put the money in that we need to put in. And in order to continue to do that, we have to course correct fiscally for the onslaught of kids. where the differences are arising and, and I'm just concerned, like I said, that, that you know, really the big piles over here and we're talking about the little piles as, as well. Part of it. I think I think one of the things to bear in mind is that I think you're you're, if you'll forgive me, lowballing the cost of those additional students. It's not just a classroom cost. It's you know it's whatever our percentage of special ed in the district. It's percentage of ELL. They're going to need reading support. They're going to need math support. Yeah, it's, you know, it's you know, it's it's a full and and overall that kind of upward enrollment pressure is going to put pressure on the entire district, particularly the facilities at some point. Which is why I was you know my brain jumped to the per pupil, you know, from the state because that's an all in kind of number. Now 100% of per pupil makes no sense because the the uptick cost of one kid isn't you know, shouldn't factor in an enormous amount of capital. But over time, curriculum supplies, educational technology, all of that, it, it's, not the, it's not a teacher and a piece of chalk. It, it's really a much bigger number. And so I think the 700,000 for SPED versus just classroom teachers isn't the right comparison. It's, it's just very difficult to quantify exactly what the costs are on a, on a student by student basis, which is why I believe the state came up with the per pupil metric as a way to try to capture that cost in an apples to apples comparison from district to district. Any other questions? Ms. Johnson, thank you for the presentation. I just want to uh, uh, comment that uh, what we're doing tonight with the superintendent's evaluation, talking about the district goals, we're trying to do now on our agenda. So, what Ms. Johnson was talking about corresponds with goal 4.4 of our present goals, which is a projection model for long range, multi year planning that is to be developed by October 2013. So thank you very much for, for running us through. Okay. Did you have any questions about some of the other documents you received? Because this document here, which I did not, oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> that I did not include in the presentation because it looks terrible on a projector, mm -hmm. um, looks like this. This is, this is a multi-year projection modeling piece. And there are two separate ones. Um, one of them, and if you go to page two first, which is a little counterintuitive, you can see that I'm using the projected enrollment for my enrollment sheet to drive a calculation to try to come up with an estimated cost of what the uptick in students is. And I think this metric is a little low because it assumes that our staffing ratios at elementary, middle, and high are sufficient right now. Um, but this was an attempt to capture the additional costs that we would expect with each increase in the projected enrollment of students. The other sheet does exactly the same thing except the numbers are being driven forward by a percentage of growth, two and a half at the elementary, one percent at the middle, and two percent at the high school, which over historically has kind of been how the growth went. And it was just a way to come up with some numbers, but you know, since I started working with this, I'm increasingly feeling like those are a little too low. You know, that they're just not as fully loaded as they need to be. And I'm struggling with that because it's really difficult to model the all-in, which is why I tumbled back into per pupil because that really is the all-in number. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison. 
I had two things. First, the comment. Um, can I ask Dr. Bodhi and Dr. and Ms. Johnson, can you please tomorrow go in, find your spreadsheet, and take out the word survival and replace it with retention? Because I think in the time when we have events like Newtown, that using survival when you're talking about children from birth to school <laughs> is just this loaded. We can use retention. And retention no, means something else. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Well, that's maybe I don't know. Sure. That, but I'm just, the survival bugs me. I'm sorry. It has bugged me for years, so I've brought this up every year. Um, so the more, the other thing is, so what's the next step? Question? Um, I, just, I, I was going to make a comment and commend. Do you have an answer for that? I think so. Okay. So, so, to, so the, uh, the chair of the budget committee, I think, started yesterday the communication uh, with other boards in the town. And uh, really, the, I don't want to speak for you. You, you, you may so want to just speak for that. Yeah, you, we started uh, yesterday, we had a meeting with. Um, the chair of the selectmen, the chair of the finance committee, and uh, Adam Chapdelaine and um, Andrew Flanagan. So um, meeting with those three, um, Diane presented all of this information. Um, obviously it was it was meant to be a kind of heads up knowing that we were all gonna get this information tonight and that of course we are on television so we didn't want anybody to be blindsided by it. So um, we decided that the next uh, the next step would be that this was going to come up at Long Range Planning, which has a meeting scheduled already for next week. Um, and so they were uh, very happy that we were able to come to them with this information so early. They agreed that obviously that the projections that we have been using and the modeling for the Long Range Planning has been on keeping a fairly stable school population. So they had, I, I truly think that they had no idea the numbers that we were starting to deal with. Um, I mean, they'd heard, obviously, everyone's heard that we've had more, but you know, when you, when you think that we have a school district of 4,200 students and you look and our numbers are actually more like 5,200, um, you know, I think a lot of people went, whoa, when did that happen? And uh, I think that was the reaction last night. And so, um, they have committed to thinking about this and, you know, like I said, taking it to long-range planning and um, then we were going to see where it came up after long-range planning. So I'm sure there will be many meetings to come, but we all agreed that this is best handled early and trying to figure out a plan before we get to town meeting so that we can go to town meeting with one cohesive plan that everyone is already okay with. Um, and they were... Um, happy to help us try to figure that out. We didn't come up with any solutions, but we made sure that they all understood the data and they were all um, interested in helping us find a solution. Did that sort of answer the question? Yeah. Any other questions for the committee? Dr. Buck. Um, this is a great question is what are the next steps? And that was an important first step. Um, we are going to have to have just a lot of discussion among ourselves as we try to think about what makes sense. And it's not just us, it's, it's, it's all of these other people that are involved as well. But the thing is, we're looking at next year's budget, and this is what's gonna, I mean, over the next month, month and a half, as we go through this process. Um, when we've had these increase of five teachers at the elementary this year, and we've had at different F, small FTEs in the secondary to deal with a, a few enrollment pres pressures, that becomes part of a new base. And and any time when you have an increase in special education costs, which which right now is definitely five hundred and probably we're predicting more like seven hundred going into next year, that's a new base. So when you're looking at what is available after you deal with all of your contractual obligations going into next year, um, what will be that delta? that we will be able to expend on new initiatives that we might want to have, or we might want to put more money into professional development, because that's, that is, is a great predictor of how you improve instruction in a district. Those are all going to be issues. And over the, next week, we're going to have the elementary principals coming and talking about the kinds of things that they see that they need. 
We're then in December having our secondary principals come and curriculum leaders as well to hear those needs as well. And so those needs are going to be balanced against what is possible. But one of the things that's going to have to be part of our thinking is we may have another uptick next year. Do we need another five or six teachers? And what does that do? And where do we get that additional money? We were, um, it, it, was, it was fortunate that um, we, we predicted uh, our, we were being very conservative in terms of what we predicted for our grants for this year, and they turned out to be better than we anticipated. Everybody was saying, oh, they're going to go down 8%, 6% if you're lucky. And in fact, that did happen in some districts. For whatever reason, we were able to be fairly level. Some ups and downs, but generally speaking. Had that not happened for us, I'm not quite sure how we would have handled it. We, we wouldn't have been able to do it, but the truth of the matter is we would have some particularly large class sizes. So going into next year, we're looking at long-range planning, you're asking, those teachers now, because of those students are going to move forward, um, we know we have this deficit, not deficit, well, we, we know we're over budget by a certain amount, and they predicted a fairly definite amount at the end of the year. How are we going to fund that potential if it upticks again next year? Where will be the source of money? And that's why this is so important to be thinking through this right now. Questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you both for informing us. Um, We'll, you know, again, public, we will be meeting next week and, um, instead of two weeks from now. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. May, may I just get, get one clarifying point? So basically what you're saying is that when we prepared the budget now, we were doing it based on where we were on October 1, 2012. And so now that we've got another 100 and some odd kids, more than we planned on based on the October 1, 2012 numbers, we're sitting here planning next year, based uh, still based on that baseline from 2012, because the additional teachers we pulled in were coming from outside sources that we, that we didn't plan for when we built this year's budget. So that we've, we've already got a built-in gap right. based on what we've got now, and to have another enrollment <coughs> increase next year is going to double the problem, so, so we, we end up next year potentially with 250 more kids than we have in the base budget based on the, the 2012 numbers. I, I think we need to create a visual so, you, so everybody can understand this, mm -hmm. because we know with this plan of three and a half seven, and mm -hmm. we assume a certain dollar amount, in fact, we'll be getting a dollar amount um, from the, the town. What, what goes against that delta? Uh -huh. Well, what goes against that delta is what we've already now seen as new mm -hmm. expenditures. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the on district expenses mm -hmm. are not going to change. No. That, that's not a, it's, uh, they're going to remain. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what will happen next year. So that delta of increase the next year is significantly already spent mm -hmm. by the changes we've experienced this year. So essentially we're talking almost one small elementary school's worth of kids yeah. over the course of these two years when you're getting into the 200s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that's right. We, we, it's that's the equivalent right. of a small school? That's exactly right. And, you know, in order to, to close the gap this year, we'll use some of the reserves that we tucked away. Mm -hmm. The sad thing about using the reserves <coughs> is that one time up. Yeah. yeah. Right. So well, we got a huge problem. Well, it's a, set, it's a social reserves. We very likely will have to go to town meeting and take some of, some of that money that we put into a stabilization account mm -hmm. out. What we don't know right now is how much of that. We would like to keep it as minimal as possible because I don't see us replenishing it any too quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, moving on then, uh, shall we? Superintendent's report. And we'll get back to budget during our uh, budget yep. subcommittee. Well, um, 
some really great news, and I sent this press release out to you. Um, the once again, uh, Arlington has been named to the AP District Honor Roll. This is the third year in a row that this has been the case. Um, this is a, um, a distinction that has, uh, it's fairly recent distinction by the College Board, and it is, it's given for maintaining and improving the percent of students scoring three or higher on the AP exam. For those that are listening and are not aware of it, AP exams are scored up to five. And if you get a three, four, or five on the, um, on the exam, what that means is you either get to not do a pre prerequisite for that particular subject in college, and in some colleges, they actually give you college credit for that. So it has a monetary value as well. Um, and in this quote, well, according to the College Board, Massachusetts has the fifth most number of school districts earning a spot on the honor roll, which is um, both increasing the number of students having access to AP exams while at the same time maintaining or increasing the number of students that score that three or higher. And um, again, Arlington High School is one of, I believe there were 30, there were, I think there were 33 um, districts in, in Massachusetts, and the highest state they had in Pennsylvania was 40. But still, we have 351 school districts in the state, and Arlington is one of the one of those that has now three years in a row been on this honor roll. And in fact, when we painted this room, they used to hang right over here. We probably need to get them back again. We haven't gotten the new poster yet. But anyway, it's, it is another affirmation of the great work that is going on. And it's not just the great work of all of our teachers in the high school, which deserve a lot of credit for this, but our students have to come prepared to do this kind of rigorous work. And that starts very <coughs> early, and an expectation of uh, the discipline of doing the work, Doing the being rigorous, and that's happening, and it's just it's just show, it's just another way that the district is demonstrating that our kids are doing really well, and our school district is doing very well. But in another way, also that I am I am particularly proud of, and this came out in the newsletter, which I I do want to emphasize again <coughs> because I think it's really important and. Well, data is important and achieving is important. We all know that, but we also, I think, in Arlington, recognize how important it is to educate the whole child, whether it's in all of our arts and music, but it's also providing a climate, a social emotional climate, in which our students can um, also succeed and get the support they need. Is there always room for improvement? Absolutely, but. Um, one award that was very, I, I was very happy to get um, was from the Massachusetts Coalition of Suicide Prevention. And it recognizes innovative work done by school and community groups. Four awards are granted with only one going to a high school every year. And so this year, um, the, our intervention coordinators at the high school, Andrea Rossi and Jess Claw and the rest of the Arlington High School Mental Health Community received the Leadership Award presented at the organization's annual leadership breakfast held in October 22nd for their innovative work. And uh, I, I think that uh, a lot of credit goes to them and certainly to all of the, the recognition of <coughs> how important this work is. So congratulations to them. Going back to achievement, um, we, our students did very well uh, this year in um, the National Merit, a National Merit Scholarship um, awardees. This year we had 24 young men and women who were named National Merit Commended Students on the 2014 National Merit Scholarship Program, which was received that distinction based on your scores on the PSAT last October. 
And in addition to those 24 for commended, we also had six students who qualified as semifinalists. And those six semifinalists will apply um, and go through the process and hopefully be one of the final National Merit Scholarship awardees um, this year. And consistent with what I was talking about, the AP uh, District Honor Roll, this year, one of the reasons we got that award is that this year we had over 100 Arlington High School students achieve the status of AP School Scholars. And all the information is in the newsletter about the number they get three or higher, the number they had four or higher in the test. And um, we had two national AP scholars, each receiving an average score of at least four on all AP exams taken, and, sco and scores of four or higher on eight or more of these exams. So we have some students that are really stretching and doing really extraordinary work. And so congratulations to all of our students um, and our teachers. Moving on to the consent agenda, uh, all I items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of Warrant 14057, dated October 24, 2013, total warrant amount $829,941.77. Approval of draft minutes of October 24, 2013, regular meeting. Approval of the Grand Canyon field trip, Odyssey Middle School, April School Vacation, 2014. I think it's cool the Grand Canyon field trip. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, may I have a motion on the consent agenda? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Um, approval of uh, Grand Canyon field trip, Odyssey, Dr. Alice Mack. I just wanted to know that be sure that the administration is <coughs> discussing a little bit. I just want to be sure that it's a, there's all safety issues are evaluated um, for the students who are going on this. I don't know. We got more information here at our desk, which gives me a bit more. It, it makes me feel a little bit better. But I just want to be sure that there's discussion and, and making sure that the students will be safe on the trip. Um, so they're going. Um, they're going through an, an agency that provides the, all of the buses and the, makes all the arrangements for it and provides the, the, the tour guides. Um, Jennifer Kraft, who is a teacher at Odyssey, is the, the lead teacher on this. And, uh, well, I didn't have Jennifer come tonight. She's willing to come if you would like to ask her more questions. Both I'm not asking this I could do it. I'm asking that the administration is just looking at things and making sure that they feel that it's 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 a it's a company that um, has been used by other schools. Um, the principal of the middle school and the head of the science department have all both supported <coughs> this trip. Can we? I, I think you're asking, it, does the company have a good reputation, essentially? Yeah. Yeah. And the company does have a good reputation. Does it mean that an accident would happen? No one can ever guarantee that. But it has a very solid reputation in running these trips, yes. Okay. What, what would, further information would you like? Uh, I just wanted to be sure that someone in the administration has looked carefully at the information from the company and thought about it. it. Part of it was that all we got was this before. And that's, I just wasn't very I looked at it all. And, uh. and I'm not saying that school cleaning has to decide. I just want to be sure that another set of eyes is going to have to. There'll be, there'll be staff and, and, and adult supervision with, with, with the students, I assume, at all the, times? Yes, the, the ratio of 10 to 1, which is fairly standard on field trips. Um, and, that's, and so that will be <coughs> our staffing. But in addition to that, that, there will be the tour leaders that are, are there provided to the company. 
you know, when they do a, a float down the Colorado, they're going to have people on the boat, but they're not our staff. Our staff is really there in a supervisory role, not in a trip, lead the trip role. Any other questions on this uh, item, Mr. Hanner? I guess you brought it to our attention. On, on day five, I'm, again, I support uh, the concern. Uh, free time shopping at Caesars Palace and then one down there, a walk down the strip, Las Vegas Boulevard to the Bellagio. I mean... <laughs> I think you're just jealous, Mr. Hanner. I, I, yeah, but I, I, again... Let's be fair. I want positive stuff coming back, that's all. Thank you. So much math in the answer. <clears throat> oh, probability. Um, the cars are pretty crazy on the strip. Yeah. They, they, I mean, it, in all seriousness, that is a safety. I mean, I, I wasn't even thinking of the, the Grand Canyon itself is, is, is a safety thing, yeah. but, but the strip is like a real. The cars are crazy there. Have you crossed Mass Avenue? Yes, I was going to say, how about Pleasant Street? Yeah. Right yeah. Our kids are crossing streets. Yeah. I, I, I just think the concern that was brought up, we, we yeah. passed it on to the superintendent. I'm sure she's yeah. going to pass it on to the right people. Yeah. All right, let's um, vote this yeah. item off the consent agenda. All those in favor of the Grand Canyon trip approval, say aye. 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 All those against? Enjoy the trip middle school students. Yes. And this is the first time this is, this is happening. This is the first so. time we've done it. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to subcommittee and liaison reports. Mr. Thielman, policies and procedures. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a first reading. So uh, we uh, have amended, we are proposing an amendment to policy DEDH, public participation in school planning meetings. Uh, <coughs> and it basically talks about, so there's, there's several points, the dissemination, Point one is the dissemination of written correspondence to members, a requirement that correspondence uh, shall include their name and address in all written statements that are distributed to us. Uh, uh, in, in number two, um, there's a requirement uh, that people uh, during public participation identify themselves by name and address. Um, Number three, there's a, there's a deleted to be considered a request to be received by uh, you and the day preceding the meeting. So just a citizen who wishes to have an item placed on the agenda to present a uh, request from writing to the administrative secretary. Uh, so these are these are sort of uh, minor changes that we found when we're moving at. This is a first reading. And then the second thing is that we have been uh, in, a, in a conversation with Rebecca Bryant from Stoneman Chandler and Miller about policy KEB and KEB R. And she's going to um, take another stab at rewriting those. At the same time that she began that uh, uh, dialogue with us, she, rec she recommended that we had a conversation with her about the idea of Stoneman Chandler and Miller doing a review of all of our policies. Um, and so we have the following motion that uh, uh, Paul and Percy and I are putting forward as the subcommittee. Move that. Stoneman Chandler and Miller review the APS policy manual for the purpose of categorizing each policy in one of the following categories. One, policies that can be appropriate, that can appropriately remain in effect as written. Two, policies that should be eliminated entirely. Three, policies that might remain with a few adjustments. And four, policies that require major rewriting. The total billable time against the district's retainer for reviewing and categorizing policies shall not exceed 18 hours. Following receipt of this report, the policy and procedure subcommittee shall request that Stoneman Chandler and Miller provide the school committee with an estimate of the time and cost of adjusting or rewriting the policies identified in categories three and four. So once the second one speak to it. Second. second. So the um, here, here's the rationale. In the 1990s, the um, National School Board Association, the Master Association of School Association of School Committees developed a model policy manual which was adopted by the Arlington School Committee. Over the last 15 years or so, we've modified this manual, often in reaction to different events that have occurred in, our, in the schools and in the town. And we have um, some of the policies are, uh, Rebecca Bryant pointed out, are actually uh, contrary to law, or they, they create rights that are beyond the scope of the law. So the most prudent thing that we can do and what works with our budget is to first have her go through a process of identifying 
those policies. Then we'll come back to the school committee and we'll get an estimate from her and we'll make a decision about what, what she should or should not do. It's, it's, it will give the school committee uh, and the policies and procedures committee a framework for policies to work on over the next year or two. I, I don't see a wholesale, quick wholesale review. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, yeah, th this is sort of uh, in, in an interesting direction that, that, uh, that I think we're proposing and going. Uh, the, the whole process of identifying policies, problematic policies, so that's, that's what we're really looking for. Uh, a policy that, due to the way it's written, could engage, uh, get us embroiled in litigation or, or some sort of an issue down the line. Uh, it is sort of an important first look. Now, what we do once we get the results of this first round uh, it, it is up to us to decide. Uh, we can go to start, uh, ask them to do a quick rewrite on some of the policies if it's a relatively small group, or we can take our findings to MASC and say, hey guys, uh, our attorney has identified these legal issues attached to these policies. Why do you think and ask their attorney to go over the policies and come back with a recommendation? So it's entirely possible that at the end of this uh, uh, first bit of research, we, we come up with a document that we might go elsewhere to, to, to think about. Uh, but I think it's, uh, in light of some of the problem we had with a couple of our policies in the past, worthwhile to uh, see which ones would need to be recrafted to uh, reduce any legal liability that might be generated. Mr. Hamm? Uh, two things, two questions. Number one, if we approve this, when we approve this, the report back to the, us, will they give uh, a little anecdote or something, is it the rationale for why their recommendations and each, each one of the things? I, I'm not looking for total change, but I mean, why they recommend this to be deleted, it's against the law, some of the things that you just said, like. Yeah, I'm sure she's going to give us some. Right. Some, yeah, yeah, great. And the second thing is, uh, I think I see this, the billable part of it, part of our retainer. Uh, yeah, it, right, it's a billable against the retainer. Right. I mean, is that, I mean it, go, it goes against the retainer. Right. It's 18 yeah. hours against the retainer. <coughs> okay. Against the retainers yeah. for how many 20. hours? It's, uh, 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 how many hours? It's 3420 based on 190 times 18. $3,420 yeah. is 18 times 190. Oh, okay. So, okay. That's there. So, that's where it's going to. That would be the max. They said that an additional expense, it's already budgeted. Right. Dr. Allison, yeah. Ms. Starks? Um, I think this is a great idea. I think that, you know, that's always the problem is that you end up with these things that have just mm -hmm. kind of mounted into this pile of things, and we don't ever get a chance. And yet, I don't know about anyone else. I know some of you do have more legal expertise than mm -hmm. I do. I do not proclaim to have any of it. So I think that's a great idea to have someone as just an eyeball on everything give us that, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle, where are you? Did, uh, any other questions before I ask one? I, I just want to say that there's, there's a tension here because, I mean, the attorneys in the room versus the school administrators in the room are looking at the policy document a little differently in that the attorneys seem to want to take a much more minimalist approach. Yeah. And I, I think that that was sort of the message I, I was getting from, from, from this. Uh, whereas the, the school administrators want a little more guidance uh, and, and things out in, in front. So how, how we balance this out that once we get this report is going to be really an interesting conversation we're going to have as well. Was there discussion about putting NASE on notice and questions sent to them first and then if they couldn't answer them going to Stoneman and asking for further help? I, I think we were trying to get this a uh, different set of eyes at it is where we're trying to go. And this is a first first take on it. Because I know in the past, Steve Finnegan, I think, is there, right? Yes. He's been incredibly helpful about policy questions. He, he certainly has been. And it's free. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Yeah. You all know where I stand on, on some of the uh, legal issues, but I think this is a very good idea to go to Stoneman Chandler and Miller to get this right here. Uh, MASC. Sometimes we get it, I always find the documents they give us, they'll give us a response and then they say, this is not, we do not feel legally bound by this, where this law firm has a degree of, of 
the legal liability uh, to it, and I think it's good to have this. And no matter how many people are looking at this, it's an awesome document. Uh, you may get to see a particular policy once every four or five years and it comes up in a review. Have them do it. Let them spend this time. I think it's a great idea for yeah, this price. Just to, to just point, we will, once this is done, we will have a conversation with you. But this helps us to have a more productive conversation. Because then we can say, okay, they've identified these policies. What do you think we should do? Okay. All right, any further discussion on this motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Harris, seven Thank zero. You. Mr. Thielman, I have one question before we fire oh. policies. We ETO. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I saw it in the minutes. Mm -hmm. If you might just uh, let, let, let the folks out there know what the initial findings were from Ms. Bryant. She okay. I would love to just, I can't find, I have like two versions of approved minutes. I don't have the, uh, is Strike that. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, so, we had a discussion about the question that was sent to you PTO about time wide PTO liability. So, um, first of all, uh, we know that either the town or the school department has a writer on our general liability policies protecting PTOs in the event of a lawsuit. Uh, Dr. Bodhi agreed to sit down with town council to get some uh, uh, ideas from the new town council. He used to work uh, in the general council's office for the Boston Public Schools, mm -hmm. so he might have some insights on, on how to respond to this. Rebecca Bryant uh, believes the school committee should make sure that its policies make clear that the district is a separate entity from the PTOs. So we need to make sure that's clear in our policies. PTOs are welcome to purchase uh, liability insurance from the National PTO Organization. Dr. Bodie pointed out that in uh, many years of experience in education, more than 30? <laughs> yes, yeah. more than 30. More than 30, uh, including uh, time on a PTO uh, in, Win in Winchester that she never heard of a PTO actually going out and getting my blood insurance. I have Laura getting sued. Or getting sued, yeah. But we did ask Ms. Bryan, and she said that yes, she this is. does happen, <laughs> and yes, PTOs can be liable for things that happen during a fundraising effort that they have. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't happen often, yeah. and so I, I think PTO has to balance the risk of it happening versus the potential risk of, of being a, a lawsuit. So maybe that's what we could do is to help us to do a little research in terms of what's happened in that area. And, and perhaps the new town council could be very helpful in that regard because he comes from the Boston Public Schools. Right. Any questions on that issue? So, I mean, if you're, if you're a PTO president hearing this, you're probably saying, what do you want us to do, right? So, I mean, uh, right now, I think the best thing is to wait and get a little more guidance. If you really want to be prudent, you can go to the National PTO Organization and price liability insurance. Is that? There's I, think, I, think what, I, I think there's no. a PTA and everyone PTA creates PTOs because PTO. PTO. they're all independent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, okay. And they don't have to pay dues and stuff. That may have changed. Well, I'm remembering an email from Rebecca. I don't have it in front of me. Well, there was some discussion that they may not be part of the National Association, oh, right. in which okay. case they wouldn't be eligible oh, right, for right. it. Okay. Um, it just may be prohibitively high. I, I know you're aware that the insurance, liability insurance for the school committee, going up every year. And um, so I have no idea what the pricing would be on that. And and, and it may not make any sense because they don't have that much money. They yeah. Raise it, you know, and they raise money, but yeah, are they going to spend it all on insurance? We'll look into it. Well, thank you for, for taking that up with uh, Rebecca. Um, moving on to budget. All right, uh, we met last night, uh, it was two parts. The first part, uh, we've started the conversation um, and Paula, uh, no, is that what yes. saying? Good. Mm -hmm. um, came in and presented um, a lot of data about the after school programs uh, that rent space um, from the schools. So she has sent out a questionnaire that they all filled out and then she's trying to um, put all of that into a spreadsheet and make some sense of it. And so we've started that conversation. 
all of the after school um, programs were uh, represented um, and uh, it was a great conversation. I think that they um, are happy to be involved in what we're doing. They understand why we're doing it. Um, we, so we are trying to figure out on our side what the expenses are and kind of what reality it has to be that we have to charge in rent so that we're obviously we're not looking to make money, but we at least need to get back what it costs us. Um, and just kind of, even just having it all on a spreadsheet was very interesting to see some of the discrepancies already that exist. So we are in the process of doing that. Um, we are involving all of the after school programs um, and they were thankful to be part of it. Um, you know, um, so we're moving forward with that. Uh, I think that, I know I had a couple of questions that I shot off to Paula today and we'll probably continue to, there's still data gathering and information gathering that we're doing. So nothing, no actionable items from that. The other half of the meeting was with, uh, as I said before, with Alan uh, Tosti, uh, Dan Dunn, um, Andrew, and um, Adam on the budget and just starting to talk about it. It was mostly just informative. We didn't do much in the way of brainstorming or problem solving yet, but um, like I said, they're gonna take it to long range planning and then from there uh, try to see uh, what long range planning might offer as advice and then move forward from there hopefully uh, with the next step uh, probably after Thanksgiving. And for the folks out there, the long range planning meeting is next week at 8 a.m. at the Town Hall Conference Room Annex. Um, what, what day? What? Thursday. Thursday? Thursday. 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 Thursday, a week from today at 8 a.m.? Any questions on budget? Thank you. And Ms. Starks, can no, sign? we don't have a next meeting, so oh, yeah. Okay. I'm waiting for the launch plan. Nothing to report. Okay, and uh, curriculum instruction? Uh, I'll be scheduling a meeting. Um, <coughs> there's at least one item that's come up um, from a group of parents, and I think there may be another one circling. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hammer on facilities? Nothing at this time. Okay, I just had a couple of things. Oh, oh, sure. Go I can ahead. have you. No, uh, go ahead. Uh, at this time, I'd like to commend uh, the workplace program we have here at the high school, run by Mr. Lundstrom and Mr. Minor. Three of their students, uh, Derek McMunn, a senior, Caleb uh, Stras Straskunas, a junior, I hope I pronounced it right, and Brendan Wall, another senior. They work today, today uh, around between uh, 12.30 and 1.30 with uh, members of Rotary to clean up and restore a memorial to Lieutenant Daniel Barry corner of Warren Street and the intersect at the intersection of Medford Street. If you drive by there, it looked like a giant bush. Now you can actually see the memorial. And uh, these young men uh, are really uh, a great reflection on their program and the people who are there. So I just wanted to pass that on. Second, I'd like to remind the committee uh, and other staff that we'll be having a special meeting regarding uh, the going paperless uh, next Tuesday, November 19th, uh, in this room at 6.30 to 8.30. I hope you can all make it. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to um, thank Ms. Starks again. Um, we spoke by phone briefly. You were telling me you were going to have this meeting this week, and it was yet last night. Um, Mr. Hainer and I, we, we were at uh, Mr. Schlickman, Dr. Bodie, we were at this con uh, conference they have every year on, on the Cape, uh, MASC, Mass Association of School Committees, and the Mass Association of School Superintendents, all over the state coming together having multiple breakout sessions on different areas of school uh, issues, law, and mm -hmm. topics. And I think I was just, I was coming out of a breakout session on uh, which municipal school relations, right? And one of the things that I, that I got from that breakout session was talk about it early, mm -hmm. talk about it openly, and, and, uh, and, 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 and keep the talk going. And so, and, and that is precisely what um, happened last night. And it was a great first step. So, so thanks for doing that. Ms. Hansen, I forgot to recognize you at the beginning of this meeting. Linda Hansen, AEA rep, she's, she joins us. Thank you um, for being here. Uh, the report from that conference last, last week was, it, it's an amazing, thing to see all the different districts and what they're doing and the superintendents and what they're doing. Um, I, I, of course, have always done music and drama in my life and, and doing the breakout session about STEM, science, technology, technology, engineering, math, and how 
folks are incorporating the arts in instruction is so helpful. And at some point when we have more time in a meeting, I'd like to get into it a little bit about what I learned. I think Bill was, Bill was in that one with me. Uh, we had one the day before we left on the superintendent evaluation. It, it was just so happy. I was just so fortunate to be there because we, I knew we were going to have this process uh, this evening and I was concerned and anxious about it. So it's, it's a great conference for, for those who've gone go again. Uh, for those who haven't gone, please do go. It's, it, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to report out that the uh, Special Education um, uh, Advisory Committee, CPAC, is holding a meeting this Monday evening, uh, the 18th, uh, the Jeff Monday morning, Jefferson Cutter House in uh, Arlington Center at 8.30 a.m. Um, and um, you all heard Jane Biondi invited everyone to Monday night's AAF thing at Flora at 6.30. And uh, again, 6 o'clock at Flora on Monday evening. Um, and once again, the, the fine dramatic presentation we saw earlier tonight, uh, Dead Man Walking, uh, this weekend. Um, anything else that may have missed that you'd like to put in before we uh, secretaries? Secretaries. Secretary's report. We received the following correspondence, the superintendent's October newsletter, an email from the superintendent informing us about the AHS <coughs> for the AP District Honor Roll, a letter from Ian Jackson, chair of the MLK Junior Birthday Observance Committee, soliciting sponsors for the event to be held on Monday, January 20th, 2014. Email congratulating the AHS mental health team for receiving the leadership award for the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention. The 9, uh, September 30th, 2013 draft of the strategy for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Education. I'm not really sure what we're supposed to do with that. But we got it. <laughs> <laughs> Information from Jen Crafts on the OMS Grand Canyon Adventure Trip plan for April Vacation 2014. Mail regarding the tools of the MIND curriculum in the, in the kindergartens. An invitation to attend an artist's opening reception at the Old Schwab Mill of David Moore from December 7th. 2013 to March 14, 2014. And that's it. Thank you. Um, one last thing that I forgot to mention that I wanted to mention. I did pick up um, a poster, getting back to Gettysburg, <laughs> from uh, someone who actually works there and is a historian there. This is all the, the, the sites, of the memorable sites and monuments. Um, and he signed it, and there's a description of the history of Gettysburg. It's 150th anniversary of that speech next week. I'd love to give this to Ms. Fitzgerald to uh, respectfully adorn uh, the room, at least for the next five months that I'm in this chair, uh, because I feel so, uh, so much pride about it, and that, and that speech is just such a wonderful um, speech. So I'll be giving this to you, too. Okay. Maybe it'll go somewhere. Gettysburg address. I expect a little <laughs> bit of pomp and circumstance. I don't have the hat tonight, so oh, okay, I will, but maybe next maybe week. Maybe next week. I have maybe. a hat. I can bring it. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe you, Bill, would issue the job in Canada and talk about the yes. uh, teacher of the year last year, uh, mm -hmm. Kathy uh, Kelly, Kelly Brown, who gave an extraordinary talk on how the Gettysburg address relates to the Common Core and how she teaches it today and, and how different it is today than she may have taught it in her social studies class a couple years ago. So maybe we could share some of that. I know, Bill, you're going to... I've already done it. You've already done it. I, did, I, I met with a group of parents this week who were asking uh, about the Common Core. I just used that as an example. I did not do justice to what she presented. No. But in that speech, I, I thought I, would, I knew everything. I learned so much that night from her. Anyway. Yeah. But but the difference was, sort of, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, what, what could have happened in years ago, we may have all experienced that you, you know, go home at night, read the Gettysburg Address, come in tomorrow and let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. So the teacher comes in and uh, what did you get out of this blank? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so then, then the teacher would explain what the Gettysburg Address yeah. was about and the significance and do all that. The difference today is that the teacher does not do that. The teacher leaves the work of the student in thinking about it, 
uh, giving some structure to it, you might start out, Kelly was talking about how she might start out with the word dedication and looking at the Gettysburg Address. I think it appears six it's times. Six, eight. How many times does it appear? And it's yeah. six times and it's used differently each time. She had the whole audience sitting there going, rereading re it and going, oh yeah, that's different each time. And the yeah. word nation is used five times. Ten times. It's, it's yeah, this is close reading. And, and, and going through the different structures of it so that the, the students start pulling the meaning of this out. And then, but then she can also throw in perspectives that they might not have. For example, in the Gettysburg Address, they use the word nation for the first time yes. ever mm -hmm. in our history since the Revolutionary War. And what's that significance? Lincoln was laying the foundation for what was going to happen with Reconstruction yeah. after the war and the healing. Before we talked about, we, not, we don't still talk about states, but in terms of the language of a president, they didn't ever talk about nation. So you, you start going into the Gettysburg Address at that level of detail, you really start, it starts to come alive and why it's such an important document. But the teacher doesn't tell them why it's important. Yeah. Did I, did I, did I, I did think you did a great job than I did. All right. Any, any further? We are going uh, to go into executive session uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union and which personnel in an open session may have a detrimental effect and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chairs that declares exiting only for the purpose of adjournment. A motion? So Okay, we'll go. All right. Aye. 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 Thank you. We're in executive session.